The officer in the centre of the squadron of horsemen raised a hand to halt them, and they bunched up and sat stolidly while the officer rose in his stirrups. Who are you? Strikers' Council, Fergus shouted back, and we'll have no scabs, blacklegs or strike breakers on this property. I am under orders from the Commissioner of Police empowered by a warrant of the Supreme Court. The officer was a heavily built man with a proud erect seat on his horse and a dark waxed moustache with points that stuck out on each side of his face. You're strike breakers, Fergus yelled, and you'll not set a foot on this property. Stand aside, warned the officer. The light was good enough now for Fergus to see that he wore the insignia of a captain and that his face was ruddy from sun and beer, his eyebrows thick and dark and beetling under the brim of his helmet. You are obstructing the police. We will charge if we have to. Charge and be damned, puppets of imperialism, running dogs of capitalism. Troop, extend order, called the captain. And the ranks opened for the second file to come up into a solid line. They sat on the restless horses, knee to knee. Strike breakers, yelled Fergus. Your hands will be stained with the blood of innocent workers this day. Batons, called the captain sternly and the troopers drew the long oaken clubs from the scabbards at their knees and held them in the right hand like cavalry sabres. "'History will remember this atrocity!' screamed Fergus. "'The blood of the lamb! Walk! March! Forward!' The line of dark horsemen waded forward through the mist as it swirled about their booted legs. "'Gallop! Charge!' sang out the captain, and the riders swung forward in their sallies. The batons extended along the horses' necks, and they plunged forward. Now the hooves drummed low thunder as they came down upon the line of standing figures. The captain was leading by a length in the centre of the line, and he went onto the wires first. Fergus's men had driven the steel jumper bars deep into the verge, pounding them in with nine-pounder hammers until only two feet of their six-foot length protruded, and they had strung the barbed wire across the road, treble strands pulled up rigid with the fencing strainers. It cut the forelegs out from under the leading charger. The bone broke with a brittle snap, startlingly loud in the dawn. And the horse dropped, going over onto its shoulder, still at full gallop. An instant later, the following wave of horsemen went onto the wire and were cut down as though by a scythe, only three of them managing to wheel away in time. The cries of the men and the screaming of the horses mingled with the exultant yells of Fergus's band as they ran forward, swinging their pick handles. One of the horses was up, riderless, its stirrups flapping, but it was pinned on its haunches, the broken forelegs flapping and spinning as it poured in anguish at the air, its squeals high and pitiful above the cries of fallen men. Fergus pulled the revolver out of the waistband of his trousers, dodged around the crazed, screaming animals and pulled the police captain to his knees. He had hit the ground with his shoulder and the side of his face. The shoulder was smashed, sagging down at a grotesque angle and the arm hanging twisted and lifeless. The flesh had been shaved from his face, ripped off by stone and gravel, so that the bone of his jaw was exposed in the mangled flesh. "'Get up, you bastard!' snarled Fergus, thrusting the pistol into the officer's face, grinding the muzzle into the lacerated wound. "'Get up, you bloody blackleg! We'll learn you a lesson!' The three troopers who had escaped the wire had their mounts under control and had circled to pick up their downed comrades, calling to them by name. Grab a stirrup, Hanky. Come on, Bowman, get up. Horses and men milling and shouting and screaming in the mist, a savage, confused conflict above which Fergus raised his voice. Stop them! Don't let the bastards get away! And his men swung the pick handles, dodging forward under the police batons to thrust and hack at the horsemen. But they were not quick enough. With men hanging from each stirrup leather, the horsemen reared and wheeled away, leaving only the badly hurt officer and another inert body lying among the wires and the terribly mutilated animals, while the police escort was doubling forward up the road in two columns. Fergus saw them and fumed impatiently, trying to force his captive to his feet, but the man was hardly capable of sitting unaided. The twenty constables stopped at fifty yards, and one rank knelt while the others fell in behind them, rifles at the ready. The command carried clearly... One round, warning fire. The volley of musketry crashed out. Aimed purposely high, it hissed and cracked over the heads of the strikers, and they scattered into the ditch. For one moment Fergus hesitated, 
and then he pointed the pistol into the air and fired three shots in rapid succession. It was the agreed signal, and instantly a storm of rifle fire crashed from the silent cottages along the road, the muzzle flashes of the hidden rifles dull, angry red in the dawn. The fire swept the road. Fergus hesitated a second only, and then he lowered the pistol. It was a Webley point four five five, a British officer's sidearm. The police captain saw his intention in his eyes, the merciless glare of the stooping eagle, and he mumbled a plea through his mangled lips, trying to lift hands to protect his face. The pistol shot was lost in the storm of rifle fire from the cottages, and the answering police fire as they fell back in confusion into the dip. The heavy lead bullet smashed into the captain's open, pleading mouth, knocking the two front teeth out of his upper jaw, and then it plunged on into his throat and exited through the back of his skull in a scarlet burst of blood and bone chips, clubbing him down into the dirt of the roadway, while Fergus turned and darted away under the cover of the hedge. Only at Fordsburg were the police raids repelled for at the other centres there had been no warning, and the strikers had not even taken the most elementary precautions of placing sentries. At the Trades Hall in Johannesburg, almost the entire leadership of the strike was assembled, meeting with the other unions who had not yet come out, but were considering sympathetic action. There were representatives of the Boilermakers' Society, the Building and Allied Trades, the Typographical Union and half a dozen others, together with the most dynamic and forceful of the strikers. Harry Fisher was there. Andrews and Ben Caddy and all the others. The police were into the building while they were deep in dialectic, debating the strategy of the class struggle, and the first warning they had was the thunderous charge of booted feet on the wooden staircase. Harry Fisher was at the head of the conference table, slumped down in his chair, with his tangled, wiry hair hanging onto his forehead, and his thumbs hooked in his braces, his sleeves rolled up around the thick, hairy arms. He was the only one to move. He leaned across the table and grabbed the rubber stamp of the High Council of Action and thrust it into his pocket. As the rifle butt smashed in the lock of the council chamber, he leapt to his feet and thrust his shoulder into the shuttered casement. It burst open, and with surprising nimbleness for such a big man, he slipped through it. The facade of the trades hall was heavily encrusted with fancy cast-iron grillwork, and it gave him handholds. Like a bull gorilla, he swarmed up onto the third-floor ledge and worked his way to the corner. Below him, he heard the crash of overturning furniture, the loud challenges of the arresting officers and the outraged cries of the Labour leaders. With his back pressed to the wall and his hands spread out to balance himself, Harry Fisher peered around the corner into the main street. It swarmed with uniformed police, and more squads were marching up briskly. An officer was directing men to the side alleys to surround the building, and Harry Fisher drew back quickly and looked around him for escape. It was senseless to re-enter another window, for the whole building was noisy with the tramp of feet and shouted orders. Fifteen feet below him was the roof of a bottle store and general dealer's shop, but the alleyway between was ten feet wide and the roof of galvanised corrugated iron. If he jumped, the noise he would make on landing would bring police running from all directions, yet he could not stay where he was. Within minutes the building would be surrounded. He inched sideways to the nearest downpipe and began to climb, he reached the overhang of the roof and had to lean out to get a grip of the rim of the guttering. Then he kicked his feet clear and hung from his arms. The drop of fifty feet below him sucked at his heels, and the guttering creaked and sagged perceptively under his weight. But he drew himself up onto his arms, wheezing and straining until he could hook one elbow over the gutter and wriggle the rest of his body up and over the edge. Still panting from the effort, he crawled slowly round the steepled, gabled roof and peered down into the main street, just as the police began hustling the strike leaders out of the front doors. Fifty helmeted constables with sloped rifles had formed a hollow square in the road, and the strikers were pushed into it, some of them bareheaded and in their shirt sleeves. Already a crowd was forming on the sidewalks, and every minute it swelled as the news was shouted from door to door, and the curious hurried from every alleyway. Harry Fisher counted the prisoners as they were brought out, and the total was twenty before the mood of the crowd began changing. "'That's it, comrades,' Harry Fisher grunted, and wished he could have been down there to lead them. They surged angrily up to the police lines, calling to the prisoners and hissing and booing the officer who ordered them, 
through a speaking trumpet to disperse. Mounted police wheeled into line, pushing the crowd back, and as the last prisoner was led out, the escort stepped out, maintaining its rigid box formation which enclosed the dejected huddle of strikers. Somebody began to sing the red flag, but the voices that joined in were thin and tuneless, and the escort moved off towards the fort, carrying away not only most of the strike leadership, but all of its moderate faction, those who had so far counselled against violence, against criminal activity and bloody revolution. Harry Fisher watched them go with a rising sense of triumph. In one stroke he had been given a band of martyrs for the cause, and had all serious opposition to his extreme views swept away. He had also, in his hip pocket, the seal of the Action Committee. He smiled a thin, humorless grin, and settled down on the canted rooftop to wait for nightfall. Mark Anders carried the general's heavy crocodile skin briefcase down the steps to the rolls and placed it on the seat beside the chauffeur while he gave him his instructions. To Grudeskir first, and then to the city club for lunch. He stood back as the general came out of the house and paused on the top step to kiss his wife as though he was about to leave on a crusade to far places. He smothered her in a vast bear hug, and when he released her, he whispered something in her ear that made her bridle and slap his shoulder. Off with you, sir, she told him primly, and Sean Courtney came down the steps, looking mightily pleased with himself, and grinned at Mark. The Prime Minister's making a statement to the House today, Mark. I'll want to see you directly afterwards. Uh, very well, sir, Mark returned the grin. I'll look for you in the visitor's gallery as soon as he's finished and give you the nod. Then we'll meet in the lobby and I'll see you up to my office. Mark helped him into the back seat of the rolls while he was speaking. He was always clumsy and awkward when moving sideways on the bad leg. Nevertheless, he resented the helping hand fiercely, hating any weakness in himself even more than he disliked it in others, and he shrugged Mark's hand away the moment he was comfortably seated. Mark ignored the gesture and went on levelly. Your notes for the cabinet meeting are in the first folder, he indicated, the crocodile bag on the front seat beside the chauffeur, and you are lunching at the club with Sir Herbert. The house sits at 2.15 and you have three questions from opposition members, even Herzog himself has one for you. Sean growled like an old lion baited by the pack. Ha! <laughs> that bastard! I have your replies clipped to your order paper. I checked with Erasmus and then I added a few little touches of my own, so please have a look at them before you stand up. You may not approve. I hope you stuck it to them hard. <laughs> of course, Mark smiled again. With both barrels. Good boy, Sean nodded. Tell him to drive on. Mark watched the rolls go down the driveway, check at the gates, and then swing out into Rhodes Avenue before he turned back into the house. Instead of going down the passageway to his own office, Mark paused in the hall and glanced guiltily about him. Ruth Courtney had gone back into the domestic depths of the kitchen area, and there were no servants in sight. Mark took the stairs three at a time, swung through the gallery and down to the solid teak door at the end. He did not knock, but turned the handle and went in, closing the door behind him quietly. The stench of turpentine was a solid shock that made his eyes water for a few seconds until they adjusted. Mark knew that he was quite safe. Storm Courtney never emerged before mid-morning from that sacrosanct area beyond the double doors that were painted with gold cherubim and flying doves. Since arriving in Cape Town, Storm Courtney had kept such hours that even her father had grumbled and huffed. Mark found himself lying awake at night, just as he was sure the general did, listening for the crunch of wheels on the gravel drive, straining his ears for the faint sounds of gay voices and mentally judging the length and passion of each farewell, troubled by feelings to which he could not place a name. His relations with Storm had retrogressed drastically. In Natal there had been the beginnings of a relaxed acceptance and undertones of warmth. It had begun with a smile and a friendly word from Storm, then he had escorted her on the daily ride, driven with her to South Beach to swim in the warm surf, and sat in the sun arguing religion with her instead. Storm was going through a fashionable period of spiritualism, and Mark had felt it his duty to dissuade her. T to dissuade her. T to dissuade her. T to dissuade her. From religion, the next step had been when Storm had announced, I need a partner to practice a new dance with. Mark had wound the gramophone, changed the needles, and danced to Storm's instruction. You really are quite good, you know, she had told him magnanimously, smiling up at him. 
light and graceful in his arms as they spun around the empty ballroom of Emoyeni. You'd make a crippled blacksmith look good. Oh, la, she laughed. You are the gallant, Mr. Anders. This had all changed abruptly. Since they had arrived in Cape Town, she had neither smiled nor spoken directly to him, and Irene Luchaz, who was to have been a house guest of Storms for four months, stayed only one night, and then caught the next mail ship home. Her name had not been mentioned again, and Storms' hostility to Mark had been so intense that she could hardly bear to be in the same room with him. Now Mark felt like a thief in her studio, but he had not been able to resist the temptation to steal a glimpse of the progress she had made on her latest canvas. Full-length windows had been put into the north wall for the light, and they looked out onto the mountain. Storm's easel stood in the centre of the bare, uncarpeted floor, and the only other items of furniture were the artist's stool, a carpenter's table cluttered with paint pots, and a chair on the raised model's dais. Framed canvases in all sizes and shapes were stacked against the walls, most of them still blank. At one stage, during the period of friendliness, she had even asked Mark to help with the timber framework. He felt a pang when he remembered. She was a ruthless supervisor, checking every joint and tack with a perfectionist's meticulous care. The canvas was almost completed, and he wondered when she had found time to do so much work in the last few days, and realised that he had misjudged her. She had been working in the mornings when he had believed she was lying abed, but now he became absorbed by the picture. He stood before it with his hands thrust into his pockets and felt a glow of pleasure spread slowly through his body. It was a picture of trees, a forest glade with sunlight playing on earth and rock, and two figures, a woman in a white dress stooping to gather wild flowers, while a man sat aside sprawled against a tree trunk and watching her. Mark was aware that it was a great advance on anything she had painted before, for although it was a simple picture, it evoked in him an emotion so strong that he felt a choke in his throat. He was awed by the peculiar talent which could have produced this work. He marvelled at how she had taken reality and refined it, captured its essence, and made of it an important occasion. Mark thought how it was possible for an untrained eye to pick out special talent in any field, just as a person who had never watched Epe used before would recognise a great swordsman after the first exchange. Now Mark, who knew nothing of painting, was moved by the discovery of real beauty. The latch clicked behind him, and he spun to face it. She was well into the studio before she saw him. She stopped abruptly, and her expression changed. Her whole body stiffened, and her breathing sounded stifled. What are you doing here? He had no answer for her, but the mood of the picture was still on him. I think that you will be a great artist one day. She faltered, taken completely off balance by the compliment and its obvious sincerity, and her eyes slipped away to the picture. All the antagonism, all the haughtiness drained from her. Suddenly she was just a very young girl in a baggy smock, smeared and daubed with oil paint, and with a wash of pleased and modest colour spreading over her cheeks. He had never seen her like this, so artless, so open and vulnerable. It was as though for a moment she had unveiled the secret compartments of her soul to allow him to see where she had kept her real treasures. Thank you, Mark, she said softly, and she was no longer the glittering butterfly, the spoiled, flighty little rich girl, but a creature of substance and warmth, the rush of his own feelings must have been as obvious. He had almost succumbed to the desire he felt to take her in his arms and hold her hard, for she stepped back a pace, looking flustered and uncertain of herself, as though she had read his intention. And yet you won't slide out of it that easily. The curtains were drawn hastily across the secret places, and the old familiar ring was in her voice. This is my private place. Even my father wouldn't dare come in here without my permission first obtained. The change was extraordinary. It was like a superb actress slipping into a familiar role. She even stamped her foot, a gesture that he found suddenly insupportable. It won't happen again, he assured her brusquely, and he stepped to the doorway, passing her closely. He was so angry he felt himself trembling. Mark! She stopped him imperiously, but it was with an effort he forced himself to turn back. His whole body felt rigid, and his lips were numb 
and stiff with anger. My father asks permission to come in here, she told him, and then she smiled, a slightly tremulous but utterly enchanting thing. Couldn't you just do the same? She had him off balance, his anger not fully aroused before she assuaged it with that smile. He felt the rigidity melting out of his body. But she had turned to the bench and was clattering her pots busily, and she spoke without looking up. Close the door as you leave, she instructed, a princess tossing an order to a serf. His anger, not yet fully assuaged, flared again brightly, and he strode to the door with his heels clashing on the bare boards, and he was about to slam it with all of his strength and hope that it smashed off its hinges when she stopped him again. Mark! He stopped but could not bring himself to answer. I'll be coming down to Parliament with you this afternoon. We will leave directly after lunch. I want to hear General Smuts's speech. My father says it will be important. He thought that if he tried to answer her, his lips might tear. They felt as stiff and brittle as parchment. Oh, dear, she murmured. I had completely forgotten. When addressing Mark Anders Esquire, one must always say, please. She crossed her hands demurely in front of her hung her head in a caricature of contrition, and made those dark blue eyes huge and soulful. Please, may I ride to Parliament with you today? I would be ever so grateful, I really would. And now you can slam the door. You should be on the stage. You're wasted as a painter, he told her. But he closed the door with studied deliberation, and she waited to hear the latch click before she dropped into the model's chair and began to shake with laughter, hugging herself delightedly. Gradually the laughter dried up, but she was still smiling as she selected a blank canvas from the stock and placed it on the easel. Working with charcoal, she blocked in the shape of his head, and it was right at the first attempt. The eyes, she whispered. Ah, his eyes are the key. And she smiled again as they appeared miraculously out of the blank canvas, surprised that she had them fixed perfectly in her mind. She began to hum softly as she worked completely absorbed. The Assembly Chamber of Parliament House was a high square hall tiered with the galleries for press and visitors. It was panelled in dark carved indigenous wood and the canopy above the speaker's chair was ornately worked in the same wood. Softly muted green carpeting set off the richer green leather of the members' benches and every seat was filled, the galleries crowded, but the silence that gripped that concourse was of extraordinary intensity, a cathedral hush into which the high, piping voice of the Prime Minister carried clearly. He made a slight but graceful figure as he stood in his seat below the Speaker's dais. The entire Witwatersrand complex is passing slowly into the hands of the Red Commandos, he used his hands expressively, and Mark leaned forward to obtain a better view. The movement brought his outer leg against Storm Courtney's, and he was aware of the warmth of her thigh against his during the rest of the speech. Three members of the police have been killed in a brutal attack at Fordsburg, and two others have been critically injured in clashes with strikers' commandos. These groups are armed with modern pattern military firearms, and they are marching freely through the streets in quasi-military formations, committing acts of outrage on innocent members of the public, on public officers going about their duties, on all who cross their paths. They have interfered with public services, transport, power and communication, and have attacked and occupied police stations. Sean Courtney, who had been slumped in his front bench seat, with one hand covering his eyes, lifted his head and said, Shame! in a sonorous voice. It was his third whiskey voice, and Mark could not help but grin as he guessed that the club lunch had fortified him for the session. Shame indeed! Smuts agreed. Now the strikers have gathered about them all the feckless and dissolute elements in the community. Their mood has become ugly and threatening. Legitimate strike action has given way to a reign of terror and criminal violence. Yet the most disturbing aspect of this terrible business is that the management of this labour dispute, or should I say, the stage managing of the strike, has passed into the hands of the most reckless and lawless men, and these men seek nothing less than the overthrow of civilised government and a rule of Bolshevik anarchy. Never! boomed Sean, and the cry was taken up across the assembly. This house and the whole nation is faced by the prospect of bloodshed and violence on a scale which none of us expected or believed possible. 
silence was unbroken now, as Smuts went on carefully. If any blame attaches to this government, it is that we have been too patient and shown too much forbearance for the miners' grievances. We have allowed them too much latitude, too much expression of their demands. This was because we have always been aware of the temper of the nation and the rights of individuals and groups to free expression. Quite right, too, Sean agreed. And hear, hear, answered Hur Hur across the floor. Now, however, we have been forced to reckon the cost of further forbearance, and we have found it unacceptable. He paused and bowed his head for a moment, and when he lifted it again, his expression was bleak and cold. Therefore, a state of martial law now exists through the Union of South Africa. The silence persisted for many seconds, and then a roar of comment and question and interjection filled the house. Even the galleries buzzed with confusion and speculation, and the press reporters jostled and fought each other out at the exit doors in the race to reach a telephone. Martial law was the weapon of last resort, and had only been used once before, during the 1916 rebellion, when de Wett had raised his commandos again and ridden against Butter and Smuts. Now there were cries of protest and anger from the opposition benches. Herzog shaking his fist and his pince-nez, glinting while the government speakers were also on their feet, voicing their support. The speakers' vain cries of order, order, were almost drowned in the uproar. Sean Courtney was signalling to Mark in the gallery, and he acknowledged and helped Storm to his feet, shielding her through the excited press of bodies as they left the gallery and went down the passage to the staircase. The general was waiting for them at the visitor's entrance. He was scowling and dark-faced with concern, a measure of his agitation, was the perfunctory kiss he dropped on Storm's uplifted face before turning to Mark. A pretty business, my boy, he seized his elbow. Come on, let's go where we can talk. And he led them to the members' entrance and up the stairs under the portraits of stern-faced chief justices to his own office. Immediately the door was closed, he waved Storm away to one of the chairs and told Mark, the regiment was called out at ten o'clock this morning. I managed to get Scott on the telephone at his home, and he's got it in hand. He's a good man. They'll be fully mobilised by now, and there's a special train being made up. They'll entrain and leave for the Vitradas Rant at eleven o'clock tonight, in full battle order. And what about us? Mark demanded. Suddenly he was a soldier again, and he dropped neatly into the role. His place was with the regiment. We'll join there. We leave tonight. We're going up in convoy with the Prime Minister, and we'll travel all night. You will drive one of the cars. Sean was at his desk now, beginning to pack his briefcase. How long will it take us? Well, it's a thousand miles, sir, Mark pointed out. I know that, damn it, snapped Sean. How long? Sean had never liked nor understood the internal combustion engine, and his dislike showed in his ignorance of their speed and capability, whereas he could finally judge a journey by wagon or horseback. Or oh, we won't be there before tomorrow evening. It's a hell of a road. Bloody motor cars, Sean growled. The regiment will be there before us by rail. They've only three hundred miles to go, Mark felt obliged to come to the defence of the car, and Sean grunted. I want you to get on home now. Have my wife pack my campaign bag and get your duffel together. We'll leave immediately I get home, he turned to Storm. Go along with Mark now, Missy. I'm going to be busy here for a while. Mark strapped up his bag and reflected how his worldly possessions had multiplied since he had joined the Courtney household. There had been a time when he could carry everything he owned in his pockets. The thought was broken by a knock on the door. Come in, he called, expecting a servant. Only Ruth Courtney never came down this end of the house on her weekly inspection, a determined crusade against dust and cockroaches. Please take it down to the car, he said in Zulu, adjusting his uniform cap in the mirror above the wash basin. All on my own? Storm asked sweetly in the same language, and he turned, startled. You shouldn't be here. Why not? Am I in danger of violation and ravishment? She had closed the door and leaned against it, her hands behind her back, but her eyes bold and teasing, bold and teasing, bold and teasing, bold and teasing. It would be safer, I should imagine, to attempt to ravish a swarm of hornets. That was merely boorish, coarse and insulting, she said. You really are improving immensely and she looked at the strapped case on the bed. 
I was going to offer to help you pack. Most men are hopeless at that, but I see you've managed. Is there anything else I can do for you? I'm sure I could think of something, he said with a solemn expression. But something in the tone of his voice made her smile and caution him. Not too much improvement in one day, please, she crossed to the bed and bounced on it experimentally. God, who filled it with bricks? No wonder Irene Luchars went home. The poor darling must have sprained her back. Her expression was innocent, but her gaze raked him, and Mark felt himself blushing furiously. Suddenly much that had puzzled him was clear, and as he turned back to the mirror, he wondered how she had found out about Irene. For something to do, he tipped the brim of his cap. Beautiful, she agreed. Are you going up there to brutalise those poor strikers or to bounce on their wives also? And before he could give expression to the shock he felt, she went on, Funnily enough, I didn't really come down here to fight with you. I once had another old tomcat, and I was really very fond of him, but he got run over by a car. Have you got a cigarette, Mark? You don't smoke? He had found it difficult to keep up with the conversation. I know, but I've decided to learn. It's so suave, don't you think? Suave was the fashionable word at that moment. She held the cigarette with an exaggerated vampish pose after he had lit it. How do I look? Bloody awful, he said, and she batted her eyes and took a tentative draw, held it for a moment, and then started to cough. Here, give it to me. He took it away from her, and it tasted of her mouth. He felt the ache in his body, the terrible wanting mingled now with a strange tenderness he had never felt before. She seemed, for once, so tender and young. Will it be dangerous? she asked, suddenly serious. Oh, I don't think so. We'll be just like policemen. They are killing policemen. She stood up and walked to the window. The view is dreadful, unless you like dustbins. I'd complain if I were you. She turned back to face him. I've never seen a man off to war before. What should I say? I don't know. Nobody ever saw me off before. What did your mother say? I never knew my mother. Oh, Mark, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to... Her voice trailed off, and he was shocked to see that her eyes were brimming with tears. Oh, it doesn't matter, he assured her quickly, and she turned back to the window. Actually, you can just see the top of Devil's Peak if you twist your head. Her voice was thick and nasal, and it was many seconds before she turned back. Well, we're both new to this, so we'll just have to help each other. I suppose you should say, come back soon. Yes, I suppose I should, and, and then what do I do? You kiss me. It was out before he had thought about it, and he was stunned by his own audacity. She stood very still, rooted by the words, and when she began to move it was with the slow deliberation of a sleepwalker and her eyes were huge and unblinking. She came across the room. She stopped in front of him, and as she lifted her arm, she came up on her toes. The air about her was filled with her fragrance, and her arms were slim and strong about his neck. But it was the softness and the warmth of her lips that amazed him. Her body swayed against him, and seemed to melt with his own, and the long artistic fingers slowly caressed the nape of his neck. He passed an arm around her waist and was again amazed at how narrow and slim it was, but the muscles of her back were firm and pliant as she arched it, pushing forward with her hips. He heard her gasp as she felt him, and a slow, voluptuous shudder shook her. For long moments she lingered, her hips pressed to his, and her breasts flattened against his tunic. He stooped over her, his hands beginning to move up the hard, resilient little back, his mouth forcing hers open, so the soft lips parted like the fleshy red petals of an exotic blooming orchid. She shuddered again, but then the sound in her throat turned into a panicky moan of protest, and she twisted out of his arms, though he tried desperately to hold her. But she was strong and supple and determined. At the door she stopped to stare at him. She was trembling. Her eyes were wide and dark, as though she had truly only seen him for the first time. Uh, oh, la! Who was talking about swarms of hornets? she mocked. But her voice was gusty and unsteady. She twisted the door open and tried to smile, 
but it was a poor lopsided thing, and she did not yet have control of her breathing. I'm not so sure of that uh, come back soon any more. She held the door open to give herself courage, and her next smile was more convincing. Don't get run over, you old tomcat. And she slipped out into the passageway. Her receding footsteps were light and dancing in the silence of the big house, and Mark's own legs were suddenly so weak that he sat down heavily on his bed. Mark drove fast, concentrating all his attention on the twisting, treacherous road through the mountains, driving the big, heavily laden rolls down the path of its own glaring, brass-bound headlights, up Bain's Kloof, where the mountain fell away on his left hand, sheer into the valley, past Worcester, with its orderly vineyards standing in dark lines in the moonlight, before the final ascent up the Hex River Mountains to the rim of the flat, compacted shield of the African interior. They came out over the top, and the vast land stretched away ahead of them, the dry, treeless Karoo, where the flat-top copies made strangely symmetrical shapes against the cold, starry sky. Now, at last, Mark could relax in the studded leather driver's seat, driving instinctively, the road pouring endlessly towards him, pale and straight out of the darkness, and he could tune his ears to the voice of the two men in the rear seat. What they don't understand, old Sean, is that if we do not employ every black man who offers himself for work, no, more than that, if we don't actively recruit all the native labour we can get hold of, it will result not only in fewer jobs for white men, but in the long run it will mean, finally, no jobs at all for the white men of Africa. A jackal, small and furry as a puppy, lolloped into the path of the headlights with its ears erect, and Mark steered carefully to miss it, his own ears cocked for Sean's reply. They think only of today. His voice was deep and grave. We must plan for ten years from now, for thirty, fifty years ahead, for a nation firm and undivided. We cannot afford once again to have Africana against Britain. Or worse, we dare not have white against black. It is not enough that we are forced to live together. We must learn to work together. Slowly, slowly, old Shawnee, the Prime Minister chuckled. Don't let dreams run away with reality. I don't deal in dreams, Yanni. You should know that. If we don't want to be torn to pieces by our own people, we must give all of them, black, white and brown, a place and a share. They ran on hard into the endless land, and the light of the lonely farmhouse on a dark ridge emphasised how vast and empty it was. Those who clamour so loudly for less work and more pay may find that what benefit they get now will have to be paid for at a thousand percent interest some day in the future. A payment in misery and hunger and suffering, Sean Courtney was speaking again. If we are to steer off the reef of national disaster, then men will have to learn to work again and to take seriously once more the demands of a disciplined and orderly society. Have you ever wondered, Sean, at how many people these days depend for their livelihood on nothing else but finding areas of dispute between the employers and the employed, between labour and management? Sean nodded, taking it up where Smuts left off as though the two were not shackled at each other with bonds that nothing can break. They travel the same road to the same goal, bound together irretrievably by destiny. When one stumbles, he brings the other down on bloody knees. When one falls, the other comes down with him. Slowly, as the stars made their circuit of grandeur across the heavens, the talk in the back seat of the rolls dwindled into silence. Mark glanced in the mirror and saw that Sean Courtney was asleep, a travelling rug about his shoulders and his black beard on his chest. His snores were low and regular and deep. And Mark felt a rush of feeling for the big man. It was a fine mixture of respect and awe, of pride and affection. I suppose that is what you would feel if you had a father, he thought, and then embarrassed by the strength and presumption of his feeling, he once again concentrated all his attention on the road. The night wind had sifted the sky with fine dust, and the dawn was a thing of unbelievable splendour. From horizon to horizon and right across the vaulted domes of the heavens, vibrant colour throbbed and glowed and flamed, until at last the sun thrust clear of the horizon. Uh, we won't uh, stop in uh, Bloemfontein or any of the big towns, Mark. We don't want anybody to see the Prime Minister. Sean leaned across the back of the seat. Uh, we'll need petrol, General. 
Uh, pick one of the roadside pumps, Sean instructed. Try and find one with no telephone lines. It was a tiny iron-roofed general dealer's store set back from the road under two scraggy eucalyptus bluegum trees. There was no other building in sight, and the open, empty felt stretched dry and sun-seared to the circle of the horizon. The plaster walls of the store were cracked and in need of whitewash, plastered with advertisement boards for Bovril and Joko tea. The windows were shuttered and the door locked, but there were no telephone lines running from the solitary building to join those that followed the road, and a single red-painted petrol pump stood at rigid attention in the dusty yard below the stoop. Mark blew a long, continuous blast on the roll's horn, and while he was doing so, the Prime Minister's black Cadillac that was following turned off the main road and parked behind them. The driver and the three members of the ministerial staff climbed out and stretched their stiff muscles. When the proprietor of the store emerged at last, unshaven, red-eyed, but cheerfully doing up his breeches, he spoke no English. Mark asked in Afrikaans, Can you fill up both cars? While the storekeeper swung the handle of the pump back and forth, and the fuel rose alternatively into the two one-gallon glass bowls on the top of the pump, his wife came out from the store with a tray of steaming coffee mugs and a platter of crisp, golden, freshly baked rusks. They ate and drank gratefully, and were ready to go on again within twenty minutes. The storekeeper stood in the yard, scratching the stubble of his beard, and watched the twin columns of red dust billowing into the northern sky. His wife came out onto the stoop, and he turned to squint up at her. "'Do you know who that was?' he asked, and she shook her head. "'That was Clever Yanni, and his English gunman. "'Didn't you see the uniform the young one wore?' He spat into the red dirt, and his phlegm bawled and rolled. Gawky! Damn gawky! He ripped the word out bitterly, and went around the side of the building to the little lean-to stable. He was clinching the girth on the old sway-back grey mare when she followed him into the store. It's none of our business, Hendrik. Let it stand. None of our business, he demanded indignantly. Didn't I fight gawky in the English war? Didn't I fight it again in 1916 when we rode with old Devet? Isn't my brother a rock-breaker on the Simmer and Yak mine? And isn't that where clever Yanni is going with his hangman? He swung up on the mare and put his heels to her. She jumped away, and he pointed her at the ridge. It was eight miles to the railway siding, and there was a telegraph in the ganger's cottage. The ganger was a cousin of his. The railway workers' union was out in sympathy with the miners now. The Action Committee would have the news in Johannesburg by lunchtime that clever Yanni was on his way. While Mark Anders drank coffee at the wayside store, Fergus MacDonald lay under the hedge at the bottom of a garden ablaze with crimson canners in orderly beds and peered through a pair of binoculars down the slope at the Newlands police station. They had sandbagged the windows and doors, the lady of the house had sat on her veranda the previous evening, drinking coffee and counting 47 police constables arriving by motor lorry to reinforce the station. Her son was a shift boss on the Simmer and Jack. Whoever commanded the police at Newlands was no soldier, Fergus decided, and grinned that wolfish, wicked grin. He had seen the dead ground instantly. Any soldier would have picked it up at a glance. Pass the word for the mills, bombs, he muttered to the striker beside him, and the man crawled away. Fergus swung the glasses up along the road where it started to climb the copies and grunted with satisfaction. The telephone wires had been cut along with the power lines. He could see the loose ends dangling from the poles. The police station was isolated. The striker called back to Fergus's side, dragging a heavy rucksack. He had a tooth missing from his upper jaw and he grinned gap-toothed at Fergus. Give them hell, comrade. Fergus's face was blackened with soot and his eyelashes were singed away. It was singed away. It was singed away. It was singed away. The Prime Minister's aide-de-camp had spelled Mark at the wheel of the rolls on the long stretch northwards from Bloemfontein. Mark had been able to sleep, hunched up on the front seat, oblivious of the lurching and shaking over the bad stretches of road, so that he woke refreshed when Sean Courtney stopped the little convoy on a deserted hilltop fifteen miles south of the built-up complex of mines and towns of the Vidvatisrand. It was late afternoon, 
and the lowering sun turned the banks of low false cloud in the north to a sombre purple hue. It was not cloud, but the discharge from the hundreds of chimneys of the power stations and refineries, of the coal-burning locomotives and the open fires of tens of thousands of African labourers in their locations and of burning buildings and vehicles. Mark wrinkled his nose as he smelled the acrid taint of the city, fouling the clean, dry air of the highfelt. The entire party took the opportunity to stretch cramped muscles and to relieve other physical needs. Mark noted wryly that nice social distinctions were observed when those members of the party who had general officers' rank and cabinet minister's status used the screen side of the parked cars while the lesser members stood out in the open road. While they went about their business, there was an argument in progress. Sean was advocating caution and a roundabout approach through the suburbs and outlying areas of Johannesburg. We should cut across to Standerton and come in on the Natal Road. The rebels are holding all the southern suburbs. They'll not be expecting us, old Sean. We'll go through fast and be at Marshall Square before they know what's happened, Yanni Smuts decided. I can't afford the extra two hours it will take us to circle around. And Sean growled at him. You always were too damned hot-headed, Yanni. Good God, you were the one who rode into the Cape with 150 men in your commando to capture Cape Town from the whole British army. Gave them the fright of their lives, the Prime Minister chuckled as he came around the back of the rolls, buttoning his trousers. And Sean followed him, went on with relish. That's right, when you tried the same tricks on Leto von Vorbeck in German East Africa, you were the one who got the fright. He roasted your ass for you. Mark winced at Sean's choice of words, and the Prime Minister's party looked to heaven and earth, anywhere except at their master's suddenly unsmiling countenance. We are going into Johannesburg on the Boysen's Road, said Yanni Smuts coldly. You'll be no damn good to us dead, grumbled Sean. That's enough, old Sean. We'll do it my way. All right, Sean agreed lugubriously. But you'll ride in the second car. The Cadillac will lead with your pennant flying. He turned to the Prime Minister's driver. Flat out, you understand. Stop for nothing. Yes, sir. Have you gentlemen got your music with you? he demanded, and all of them showed him the sidearms they carried. Mark? Sean turned to him. Get the manlicker off the roof. Mark unstrapped the leather case from the luggage rack and assembled the 9.3mm sporting rifle, the only effective weapon they had been able to find at short notice in Somerset House before leaving. He loaded the magazine and handed the weapon to Sean, then slipped two yellow packets of ammunition into his own pockets. Good boy, Sean grunted and peered at him closely. How are you feeling? Did you get some sleep? I'm fine, sir. Take the wheel. Darkness fell swiftly, smearing the silhouettes of the blue gum trees along the low crests of the rolling open ground, crowding in the circle of their vision. There were the flickering pinpoints of open cooking fires from a few of the native shacks among the hills, but these were the only signs of life. The road was deserted, and even when they began to speed past the first brick-built buildings, there were no lights and the stillness was unnatural and disquieting. The main power station uh, has shut down. The coal miners were limiting supply to 50 tonnes a day for essential services, but now they've stopped even that, the Prime Minister mused aloud, and neither of them answered him. Mark followed the twinkling red rear lights of the Cadillac, and the darkness pressed closer. He switched on the main beams of his headlights, and suddenly they were into the narrow streets of Boysens, the southernmost suburb of Johannesburg. The miners' cottages crowded the road like living and menacing presences. On the left, against the last faint glimmer of the day, Mark could make out the skeletal shape of the steel headgear at Crown Mine's main haulage, and ahead the low table-like hillocks of the mine dumps gave him a nostalgic twinge. He thought suddenly of Fergus MacDonald and Helena, and glanced once again to his left, lifting his eyes from the road for a moment. Just beyond the Crown Deep headgear, not more than a mile away, was the cottage on Lover's Walk, where she had taught him he was a man. The memory was too wrapped around with pain and guilt, and he thrust it aside and turned his full attention back to the road, just as the first rifle shots sparkled from the darkened cottage windows on the right side of the road ahead. Instantly he was judging the angle and field of the enemy fire, noticing how they had chosen the curve of the road where the vehicles must slow. Good, he thought dispassionately, applauding the choice and he hit the gear lever of the rolls, double-de-clutching into a lower gear to build up revolutions for the turn. 
Get down, he shouted at his illustrious passengers. Ahead, the Cadillac swerved wildly at the volley and then recovered and went roaring into the turn. Six or seven rifles, Mark estimated, and then saw the high hedge and the open pavement below the cottage windows. He would give them a changing, closing target, he decided, and used the power and rush of the rolls to broadside up onto the pavement under the cover of the hedge. Foliage brushed with a light rushing whisper against the side of the roaring vehicle, and behind him a service revolver banged lustily as Sean Courtney fired through the opening window. Mark hit the brakes and fanned the back of the rolls through the turn, bounding off the pavement, and let her sway out across the road to further confuse the riflemen in the cottages. Then he tramped down hard on the accelerator, gunned her through the turn, and went howling down into the dark, deserted commercial area of Boyson's, leaving the stupefied rifleman staring into the deserted bend and listening to the receding note of the Rolls-Royce engine. Only two miles and they'd be through the danger area, over the ridge and into Johannesburg proper. Ahead of him, the Cadillac was running through the area of shops and warehouses and small factories, its headlights blazing harshly on the buildings that lined the road, carving a tunnel of light down their avenue to safety. In the back seat of the rolls, the two generals had not taken Mark's advice to seek cover and were both sitting bolt upright, discussing the situation objectively in cool, measured tones. That was quick thinking, Smuts said. They weren't expecting that, Dern. He's a good lad, Sean agreed. But you are wasting your time with that pistol. Oh, it gives me something to do, Sean explained as he reloaded the chambers of his revolver. You should have ridden with my commando, old Sean. I would have taught you to save ammunition, Smuts sought revenge for Sean's earlier remarks. The headlights of the Cadillac tipped slightly upwards as it charged through the dip and reached the first rising ground. They all saw the roadblock at the same moment. It was flung up crudely across the road. Oil drums, balks of timber, iron bedsteads, sandbags and household furniture obviously dragged from the cottages. Sean swore loudly and with ferocity. I can turn now, Mark shouted, but they'll get us when we slow down and we'll have to go back through the ambush. Watch the Cadillac, Sean shouted back. The heavy black machine had not hesitated and it roared up the slope at the barricade, picking the spot which seemed weakest. He's going to open the breach. Follow him, Mark. The Cadillac smashed into the roadblock and tables and chairs flew high into the night. Even above the roar of wind and engine, Mark could hear the tearing, crashing impact, and then the Cadillac was through and going on up the ridge. But its speed was bleeding away, and a white cloud of steam plumed from the torn radiator. However, they had forged a breach in the barricade, and Mark steered for it, bumping over a mangled mass of timber and then accelerating away up the slope, gaining rapidly on the leading vehicle. The Cadillac was losing speed, clearly suffering a mortal injury, Shall I stop for them? Mark demanded. No, said Sean. We've got to get the Prime Minister. Yes, said Smuts. We can't leave them. Make up your bloody minds, yelled Mark. And there was a stunned, disbelieving silence in the back, and Mark began to break for the pickup. The machine gun opened from the scrubby bush at the base of the nearest mine dump. The tracer flailed the night, brilliant white fire sweeping down the road in a blinding storm. The high, ripping, tearing sound was unmistakable and Mark and Sean exclaimed together in appalled disbelief. Vickers! The Prime Minister's green and golden pennant on the bonnet of the Cadillac drew the deadly sheet of fire, and in the horrified microseconds that Mark watched, he saw the car begin to break up. The windshield and side windows blew away in a sparkling cloud of glass fragments. The figures of the three occupants were plucked to pieces like chickens caught in the blades of a threshing machine. The Cadillac slewed off the road and crashed headlong into the blank wall of Timber Warehouse on the edge of the road. And still, the relentless stream of Vickers' fire tore into the carcass, punching neat black holes into the metalwork, holes that were rimmed with bare metal that sparked in the headlights of the rolls like newly minted silver dollars. It would only be seconds before the gunner swivelled his Vickers onto the rolls, Mark realised, and he searched the road ahead for a bolt hole. Between the timber warehouse and the next building was a narrow alleyway, barely wide enough to admit the rolls. Mark swung out to make a hay-cart turn for the alley, and the gunner guessed his intention, but was stiff and low on his traverse as he swung the vicars onto the rolls. The sheet of bullets ripped the surface of the road, 
a boiling, teeming play of dust and tarmac that ran down under the side of the car. Before the gunner could correct his aim, the petrol tank of the ruined Cadillac exploded in a woofing clap of sound and a vivid rolling cloud of scarlet flame and dense black smoke. Under its cover, Mark steered for the alleyway and slammed the rolls into it, although she was suddenly heavy on the steering and thumping brutally in her front end. Fifty feet down, the alley was blocked with a heavy haulage trailer, piled high with newly sawn timber balks, and Mark skidded to a halt and jumped out. He saw that for the moment they were covered by the corner of the warehouse from the vicars. But the timber trailer cut off their escape down the alley and it would be only minutes before the strikers realised their predicament and moved the vicars to enfilade the alleyway and shoot them to pieces. One glance showed him that machine gun fire had shredded the offside leading wheel. Mark jerked open the rear door and snatched the manlicker from Sean and paused only a moment to snap at the two generals. Get the wheel changed. I'll try and hold them off. Then he was sprinting back down the alleyway. I shall have to insist that in future when he gives me an order he calls me sir, Sean said with thin humour, and turned to Smuts. Have you ever changed a wheel, Yanni? Don't be stupid, old Sean, I'm a horse soldier. And your superior officer, Smuts smiled back at him, with his golden beard looking like a refined Viking in the reflected headlights. Bloody hell, grunted Sean. You can work the jack. Mark reached the corner of the warehouse and crouched against it, checking the load of the manlika before glancing around. The Cadillac burned like a huge pyre, and the stink of burning rubber and oil and human flesh was choking. The body of the driver still sat at the wheel, but the smoky red flames rushed and drummed about him so that his head was blackening and charring and his body twisted and writhed in a slow, macabre ballet of death. There was a wind that Mark had not noticed before, a fitful, inconstant wind that gusted and puffed down the ridge, rolling thick clouds of the stinking black smoke across the road, then changing strength and direction, so that for a few seconds the smoke pall once again poured straight upwards into the night sky. Over all blazed the flickering orange wash of the flames, uncertain light which magnified shadow and offered false perspective. Mark realised that he had to get across the road into the scrub, and eroded ground below the mine dump before he could get a chance at the vicar's gunner. He had to cross fifty open yards before he reached the ground where he could turn the clumsiness and relative immobility of the vicar's to his own account. He waited for the wind. He saw it coming, rustling the grass tops in the firelight and rolling a dirty ball of newspaper down the road. Then it picked up the smoke and wafted it in a stinking black pall across the open roadway. Mark launched himself from the corner of the warehouse and had run twenty paces before he realised that the wind had tricked him. It was merely a gust, passing in seconds and leaving the night still and silent when it had gone, silent except for the snapping, crackling flames of the burning Cadillac. He was halfway across as the smoke opened again, and the cold weight of dread in his belly seemed to spread down into his legs and slow them as he ran like a man in shackles but the battle clock in his head was running clearly, tolling off the seconds, judging finally the instant that the vicar's gunner up on the dump spotted his shadowy running figure, judging the time it took for him to swing and recite the heavy weapon. Now, he thought, and rolled forward from the waist without checking his speed, going onto his shoulder and somersaulting, ducking under the solid blast of machine gun fire that came at the exact second he had expected it. The momentum of his fall carried him up onto his feet again, and he knew he had seconds before the unsighted gunner picked him up again. He plunged onwards, and lances of pain shot through the old bullet wounds in his back, wounds which had not felt in over a year. The pain was in anticipation, as well as from the wrench of his fall. The bank of red earth on the far side of the road seemed to loom far off, while instinct warned him that the vicar's was on to him again. He launched himself feet first like a baseball player sliding for the plate, and at the same instant the stream of Vickers' bullets tore a leaping sheet of dust off the lip of the bank, and the ricochets screamed like frustrated banshees and wailed away into the night. Mark lay under the bank for many seconds, with his face cradled in the crook of his arm, sobbing for breath, while the pain in his old wounds receded and his heart picked up its normal rhythm. When he lifted his head again, his expression was bleak and his anger was cold and bright and functional.
Fergus MacDonald swore softly with both hands on the firing handles of the Vickers, his four fingers still holding the automatic safety catch open and his thumbs poised over the firing button. He kept the weapon swinging in short rhythmic traverses back and forth as he peered down the slope. But he was swearing monotonous profanity in a low, tight whisper. The man beside him was kneeling, ready to feed the belt into the gun, and now he whispered hoarsely, I think you got him. The hell I did, hissed Fergus, and jerked the gun across as something in shadow caught his eye down on the road. He fired a short holding burst and then muttered, Right, let's pull out. Damn it, comrade, we've got them, protested the loader. You bloody fool, didn't you see him? Fergus asked. Didn't you see the way he crossed the road? Don't you realise we've got a real ripe one on our hands? Whoever he is, he's a killer. Are we going to let one bastard chase us? You're so right, snapped Fergus. When it's that bucko down there, I'm not going to risk this gun. It's worth a hundred trained men. He patted the square steel breech block. We came here to kill clever Yanni, and he's down there cooking in his fancy motor car. Now let's get the hell out of here. And he started the complicated process of unloading the vicar's cranking it once to clear the chamber of its live round, and then cranking again to clear the round in the feed block. "'Tell the boys to cover us when we pull back,' he grunted, as he extracted the ammunition belt from the breech poles, and then started uncoupling the vickers from its tripod. "'Come on, come on, work quickly!' he snapped at his loader. "'That bastard is on his way. I can feel him breathing down my neck already.' There were eight strikers on the slope of the dump, Fergus and two for the vickers with five riflemen spread out around the gun to support and cover. Right, let's go. Fergus carried the thick jacketed barrel over one shoulder and a heavy case of ammunition in his left hand. His number two wrestled with the ungainly fifty pounds weight of metal tripod and the number three carried the five-gallon can of cooling water and the second case of ammunition. We're pulling out, Fergus called to his riflemen. Look lively, that's a dangerous bastard coming after us. They ran in a group bowed under their burdens, feet slipping in the loose white cyanided sand of the dump. The shot was from the left. Fergus had not expected that, and it was impossibly high on the dump. The bastard must have grown wings and flown to get there, Fergus thought. The report was a heavy, booming clap, some sort of sporting rifle, and behind him the number three made a strange grunting sound, as though his lungs had been forcibly emptied by a heavy blow. Fergus glanced back and saw him down. A dark, untidy shape on the white sand. Good Christ, gasped Fergus. It had to be fluky shooting at that range, and in this impossible light, just the early stars and the ruddy glow of the burning Cadillac. The rifle boom boomed again, and he heard one of his riflemen scream and then thrash about wildly in the undergrowth. Fergus knew he had judged his adversary fairly. He was a killer. They were all running now, shouting and firing wildly as they scattered back under the lee of the dump, and Fergus ran with them. Only one thought in his mind. He must get his precious vicars safely away. The sweat had soaked through his jacket between his shoulders and had run down from under his cap so that he was blinded and unable to speak when at last he tumbled into the cover of a deep donga and sat against the earth of the bank with the machine-gun cradled in his arms like an infant. One after another, his rifleman reached the donga and fell thankfully into cover. "'How many were there?' gasped one of them. "'I, I don't know,' panted another. "'Must have been a dozen zarps at least. "'They got Alfie, and they got Henry also. "'I saw five of them.' Fergus had recovered his breath enough to speak now. "'There was only one. "'Only one. "'But a good one.' Did we get Slim Yanni? Yes, said Fergus grimly. We got him all right. He was in the first car. I saw his flag and I saw him cooking. We can go home now. It was a little before eleven o'clock when the solitary Rolls-Royce was halted at the gates of police headquarters on Marshall Square by the suspicious sentries. But when the occupants were recognised, half a dozen high-ranking police and military officers hurried down the steps to welcome them. The Prime Minister went directly to the large visitors' drawing room on the first floor, which had been transformed into the headquarters of the military administration, empowered and entrusted by the declaration of martial law with the government of the nation. The relief on the faces of the assembled officers was undisguised. 
The situation was a mess, but Smuts was here at last, and now they could expect order and direction and sanity to emerge from the chaos. He listened to their reports quietly, tugging at his little goatee beard, his expression becoming more grim as the full extent of the situation was explained. He was silent a little longer, brooding over the map, and then he looked up at General von Deventer, an old comrade-in-arms during two wars, a man who had ridden with him on that historic commando into the Cape in 1901, and who had fought beside him against the wily old German, Letau von Vorbeck, in German East Africa. Jacobus, he said, you command the East Rand. Van Deventer whispered an acknowledgement, his vocal cords damaged by a British bullet in 01. Sean, you have the West. I want the Brixton Ridge under our control by noon tomorrow. Then, as an afterthought, Have your lads arrived from Natal yet? I hope so, said Sean Courtney. So do I, Smuts smiled thinly. You will have a merry time taking the ridge single-handed. The smile flickered off his face. I want your battle plans presented by breakfast time, gentlemen. I don't have to remind you that, as always, the watchword is speed. We have to cauterize this ulcer and bind it up swiftly. In early autumn... The Heifeld sun has a peculiar brilliance, pouring down through an atmosphere thinned by altitude out of a sky of purest, gayest blue. It was weather for picnicking and for lovers in quiet gardens. But on the 14th of March 1922 it was not calm, but a stillness of a menacing and ominous intensity which hung over the city of Johannesburg and its satellite towns. In just two days, Van Deventer had swept through the East Runt, stunning the strikers with his Boer commando tactics, rolling up all resistance in Bononi and Dunswat, recapturing Brakpan and the mine, while the Brits' column, under his command, drove through the Modder and Gedult mines and linked with Van Deventer at Springs. In two days they had crushed the revolt on the East Rand, and thousands of strikers came in under the white flag to be marched away to captivity and eventual trial. But Fordsburg was the heart and the Brixton Ridge, which commanded it, was the key to the revolt. Now, at last, Sean Courtney had the ridge. But it had been two days of hard and bitter fighting. With artillery and air support, they had swept the rocky copies, the school buildings, brick fields, the cemetery, the public buildings and the cottages, each of which the strikers had turned into a strong point. And in the night they had carried in the dead of both sides, buried them in the Milner Park Cemetery, each with his own comrades, soldier with soldier, and striker with striker. Now Sean was ready for the thrust to the heart, and below them the iron roofs of Fordsburg blinked in the fine, clear sunlight. Here he comes now, said Mark Anders, and they all lifted their binoculars and searched for the tiny fleck of black in the immense tall sky. The DH-9 sailed in sedately, banking slowly in from the south and levelling for the run over the cowering cottages of Fordsburg. Through the lenses of his glasses, Mark could make out the head and shoulders of the navigator in the forward cockpit as he hoisted each stack of pamphlets onto the edge of the cockpit, cut the strings and then pushed them over the side. They flurried out in a white storm behind the slow-moving machine, caught in the slipstream, spreading and spinning and drifting like flocks of white doves. A push of the breeze spread some of the papers towards the ridge and Mark caught one out of the air and glanced at the crude printing on cheap thick paper. It read, Martial Law, Notice. Women and children and all persons well disposed towards the government are advised to leave before 11am today that part of Fordsburg and vicinity where the authority of the government is defied and where military operations are about to take place. No immunity from punishment or arrest is guaranteed to any person coming in under this notice who has broken the law. Sean Courtney, Control Officer. It was clumsy syntax. Mark wondered who had composed it as he crumpled the notice and dropped it into the grass at his feet. What if the pickets won't let them come out, sir? he asked quietly. I don't pay you to be my conscience, young man, Sean growled warningly, and they stood on in silence for a minute. Then Sean sighed and took the cigar from his breast pocket and offered one to Mark as a conciliatory gesture. What can I do, Mark? Must I send my lads into those streets without artillery support? He bit the tip off his cigar and spat it into the grass. 
Whose lives are more important, the strikers and their families or men who trust me and honor me with their loyalty? It's much easier to fight people you hate, Mark said softly, and Sean glanced at him sharply. Where did you read that? he demanded, and Mark shook his head. At least there are no blacks caught up in this, he said. Mark had personally been in charge of sending disguised black policemen through the lines to warn all tribesmen to evacuate the area. Poor blighters, Sean agreed. I wonder what they make of this white man's madness. Mark strode to the edge of the shallow cliff, ignoring the danger of sniping fire from the buildings below, and glassed the town carefully. Suddenly he exclaimed with relief, They're coming out! Far below where they stood, the first tiny figures straggled out of the entrance of the Friedadorp subway. The women carried infants and dragged reluctant children at arm's length. Some were burdened with their personal treasures. Others brought their pets, canaries in wire cages, dogs on leashes. The first small groups and individuals became a trickle and then a sorry, toiling stream, pushing laden bicycles and handcarts or simply carrying all the possessions they could lift. Send a platoon down to guide them and give them a hand, Sean ordered quietly, and brooded heavily with his beard on his chest. I'm glad to see the women out of it, he growled, but I'm sad for what it means. The men are going to fight, Mark said. Yes, Sean nodded. They're going to fight. Uh, I had hoped we had had enough slaughter, but they're going to make a bitter ending to a tragic tale. He crushed the stub of his cigar under his heel. You're right, Mark, go down and tell Molyneux that it's on. Eleven hundred hours and we'll open the barrage. Good luck, son. Mark saluted, and Sean Courtney left him and limped back from the crest to join General Smuts and his staff, who had come out to watch the final sweep of the battle. The first shrapnel bursts clanged across the sky and burst in bright gleaming cotton pods of smoke above the roofs of Fordsburg, cracking the sky and the waiting silence with startling violence. They were fired by the horse artillery batteries on the ridge, and immediately the other batteries on Sour Street joined in. For twenty minutes the din was appalling, and the brilliant air was sullied by the rising mist of smoke and dust. Mark stood in the hastily dug trench and peered over the parapet. There was something so dreadfully familiar in this moment. He had lived it fifty times before, but now he felt his nerves screwing down too tightly and the heavy, indigestible lump of fear in his guts nauseated him. He wanted to duck down below the parapet, cover his head to protect his ears from the great metallic hammer blows of sound, and stay there. It required an immense effort of will to stand where he was and to keep his expression calm and disinterested. But the men of A Company lined the trench on each side of him, and to distract himself he began to plan his route through the outskirts of the town. There would be roadblocks at every corner, and every cottage would be held. The artillery barrage would not have affected the strikers under cover, for it was limited to shrapnel bursts. Sean Courtney was concerned with the safety of over a hundred police and military personnel who had been captured by the strikers and were being held somewhere in the town. No high explosive was the order, and Mark knew his company would be cut to ribbons on the open streets. He was going to take them through the kitchen yards and down the sanitary lanes to their final objective, the trades hall on commercial and central streets. He checked his watch again, and there were four minutes to go. All right, sergeant, he said. The order passed quickly down the trench, and the men came to their feet, crouching below the parapet. It's like old time, sir, the sergeant said affably, and Mark glanced at him. He seemed actually to be enjoying this moment, and Mark found himself hating the man for it. Let's go, he said abruptly, as the minute hand of his watch touched the black hairline division, and the sergeant blew his whistle shrilly. Mark put one hand on the parapet and leapt nimbly over the top. He started to run forward, and from the cottages ahead of him came the harsh crackling of musketry. Suddenly he realised he was no longer afraid. He was little more than a youth, with smooth pink cheeks and the lightest golden fluff of a moustache on his upper lip. They shoved him down the last few steps into the cellars, and he lost his footing and fell. Another yellow belly, called the escort, a strapping bearded fellow with a rifle slung on his shoulder and the red band around his upper arm. 
Caught him trying to sneak out of the subway. The boy scrambled to his feet. He had skinned his knees in his fall and he was close to tears as Harry Fisher towered over him. He carried a long black shambok in his right hand, a vicious tapered whip of cured hippo hide. A traitor, bellowed Fisher. In the last days of continuous planning and fighting, the strain had started to show. His eyes had taken on a wild, fanatical glare. His movements were jerky and exaggerated, and his voice ragged and overloud. No, comrade, I swear I'm no traitor, the youth bleated pitifully. A coward, then, shouted Fisher, and caught the front of the boy's shirt in one big hairy fist and ripped it open to the waist. I, I didn't have a rifle, protested the boy. There'll be rifles for all later, when the first comrades die. The lash of the shambok split the smooth white skin of the boy's back like a razor stroke, and the blood rose in a vivid bright line as he fell to his knees. Harry Fisher stood over him and swung the shambok until there were no more screams or groans, and the only sound in the cellar was the hiss and splat of the lash. And then he stood back panting and sweating. Take him out so the comrades can see what happens to traitors and cowards. A striker took each of the boy's arms, and as they dragged him up the steps, the flesh of his back hung in ribbons and tatters, and the blood ran down over his belt and soaked into the gabardine of his breeches. Mark dropped cap-footed over the back wall into the tiny paved yard. Cases of empty beer bottles were piled high along the side walls, and the smell of stale liquor was fruity and heady in the noon heat. He'd reached the bottle store in Mint Road, less than an hour after the starting time of the drive, and the route he had led his men through the backyards and over the rooftops had been more successful than he had dared hope. They had avoided the roadblocks, and twice had outflanked groups of strikers dug into strong positions, surprising them completely and scattering them with a single volley. Mark ran across the yard and kicked in the back door of the bottle store, and in the same movement flattened himself against the wall clear of the gaping doorway and any striker fire from the interior of the building. The sergeant and a dozen men followed him over the wall and spread out to cover the doorway and barred windows. He nodded at Mark, and Mark dived through the doorway sideways with the rifle on his hip and his eyes screwed up against the gloom after the bright sunlight outside. The store was deserted. The shutters bolted down over the front windows and the shelves of bottles untouched by looters, in testimony of the striker's discipline. The tiers of bottles stood neatly in their gaily coloured labels, glinting in the dusky light. The last time Mark had been in here was to buy a dozen bottles of porter for Helena MacDonald. But he pushed the thought aside and went to the shuttered windows, just as the sergeant and his squad burst in through the back door. The shutters had been pierced by random shrapnel and rifle fire, and Mark used one aperture as a peephole. Fifty yards across the road was the trades hall, and the complex of trenches and defences that the strikers had thrown up around the square. Even the public lavatories had been turned into a blockhouse, but all the defenders' attention was directed into the streets across the square. They lined the parapets and were firing frantically at the kilted running figures of the Transvaal Scottish racing towards the square from the station side. The strikers were dressed in a strange assortment of garb, from greasy working overalls and quasi-military safari jackets, caps and slouch hats and beavers, to Sunday suits, waistcoats and ties. But all of them wore bandoliers of ammunition draped about their shoulders, and their backs were exposed to Mark's attack. A volley through the bottle store windows would have done terrible execution among them, and already the sergeant was directing his men to each of the windows in a fierce and gleeful croak of anticipation. I could order up a machine gun, Mark thought, and something in him shied away from the mental image of a vicar's firing into that exposed and unsuspecting group. If only I hated them. As he watched, first one and then the others of the strikers at the barricades, crouched down hopelessly from the withering fire the Highlanders were now pouring onto them. Fix bayonets, Mark called to the men, and the steel scraped from the metal scabbards in the sombre gloom of the store. A stray bullet splintered the shutter above Mark's head and burst a bottle of Scotch whisky on the shelves behind them. The smell of the spirit was sharp and unpleasant, and Mark called again, On my order, break open the windows and doors, and we'll show them steel. The shutters crashed back, 
The main doors flew open, and Mark led his company in a howling, racing line across the road. Before they reached the first line of sandbags, the strikers began throwing down their rifles and jumping up with their hands lifted above their heads. Across the square, the Highlanders poured into the street, cheering and shouting, and raced for the barricades. Mark felt a surge of relief that he had taken the risk of going with the bayonet rather than ordering his men to shoot down the exposed strikers. As his men ran into the square, knocking the weapons out of their hands and pushing the strikers into sullen groups, Mark was racing up the front steps of the trades hall. He paused on the top step, shouted, Stand back inside! and fired three rifle bullets into the brass lock. Harry Fisher leaned against the wall and peered out of the sandbag window into the milling, yelling chaos of the square. The madness of unbearable despair shook the huge frame, and he breathed like a wounded bull when it stands to take the matador's final thrust. He watched his men throw down their arms, saw them herded like cattle with their hands held high, stumbling on weary, careless feet, their faces grey with fatigue and sullen in defeat. He groaned, a low, hollow sound of emotional agony stretched to its furthest limits, and the thick shoulders sagged. He seemed to be shrinking in size. The great unkempt head lowered, the blazing vision dimmed in his eyes as he watched the young lieutenant in battle dress race up the stairs below him and heard the rifle shots shatter the lock. He shambled across to his desk, and slumped down into the chair facing the closed door, and his hand was shaking as he drew the service revolver from his belt and cocked the hammer. He laid the weapon carefully on the desk in front of him. He cocked his head and listened to the shouted orders and the trampling confusion in the square below for a minute. Then he heard the rush of booted feet up the wooden staircase beyond the door. He lifted the revolver from the desk, and leaned both elbows on the desk top to steady himself. Mark burst in through the main doors of the hall and stopped in surprise and confusion. The floor was covered with prostrate bodies. It seemed there must be hundreds of them. As he stared, a captain of Highlanders and half a dozen men burst in behind him. They stopped also. Good God, panted the captain. And then suddenly Mark realised that the bodies were all uniformed. Police car key, hunting green kilts, Barathea. They've slaughtered their prisoners, Mark thought with nightmare horror, staring at the mass of bodies. Then suddenly a head lifted cautiously, and another. Oh, thank God, breathed the captain beside Mark, as the prisoners began scrambling to their feet, their faces shining with relief, a single voice immediately becoming a hubbub of nervous gaiety. They surged for the door, some to embrace their liberators and others merely to run out into the sunlight. Mark avoided a big police sergeant with rumpled uniform and three days' growth of beard, ducked under his arms and ran for the staircase. He took the stairs three at a time and paused on the landing. The doors to five offices on this floor were standing open. The sixth was closed. He moved swiftly down the corridor, checking each of the rooms. Cupboards and desks had been ransacked, and the floors were ankle-deep in paper, chairs overturned, drawers pulled from desks and dumped into the litter of paper. The sixth door at the end of the passage was the only one closed. It was the office of the local union chairman, Mark knew, Fergus MacDonald's office, the man for whom he was searching, driven by some lingering loyalty, by the dictates of shared comradeship and friendship, to find him now, and to give him what help and protection he could. Mark slipped the safety catch on the rifle as he approached the door. He reached for the handle, and once again that sense of danger warned him. For a moment he stood with his fingers almost touching the brass lock, then he stepped quietly out of the line of the doorway, reaching sideways, and he rattled the handle softly and then turned it. The door was unlocked, and the latch snicked, and he pushed the door open. Nothing happened, and Mark grunted with relief and stepped through the doorway. Harry Fisher sat at the desk facing him, a huge menacing figure crouching over the desk with the big tousled head lowered on massive shapeless shoulders and the revolver held in both hands, pointing directly at Mark's chest. Mark knew that to move was death, 
he could see the rounded, leaden noses of the bullets in the loaded chambers of the cylinder, and the hammer fully cocked, and he stood frozen. It is not defeat, Harry Fisher spoke, with a strangled, hoarse voice that Mark did not recognise. We are the dragon's teeth. Wherever you bury one of us, a thousand warriors will spring up. It's over, Harry. Mark spoke carefully, trying to distract him, for he knew he could not lift the rifle and fire in the time Harry Fisher could pull the trigger. No, Fisher shook the coarse, tangled locks of his head. It is only just beginning. Mark did not realise what he was doing until Harry Fisher had reversed the pistol and thrust the muzzle into his own mouth. The explosion was muffled, and Harry Fisher's head was stretched out of shape, as though it were a rubber ball struck by a bat. The back of his skull erupted, and a loose mass of bright scarlet and custard yellow splattered the wall behind him. The impact of the bullet hurled his body backwards, and his chair toppled and crashed over. The stench of burned powder hung in the room on filmy wisps of gun smoke, and Harry Fisher's booted heels kicked and tapped a jerky, uneven little dance on the bare wooden floor. Where is Fergus MacDonald? Mark asked the question a hundred times of the files of captured strikers. They stared back at him, angry, bitter, some of them still truculent and defiant, but not one of them even deigned to answer. Mark took three of his men under the pretext of mopping up patrol down to Lover's Walk as far as the cottage. The front door was unlocked and the beds in the front room were unmade. Mark felt a strange repugnance of mind, balanced by a plucking of lust at his loins when he saw Helena's crepe de chine dressing gown thrown across the chair and the crumpled pair of cotton panties dropped carelessly on the floor beside it. He turned away quickly and went through the rest of the house. The dirty dishes in the kitchen had already grown a green fuzz of mould, and the air was stale and disused. Nobody had been in these rooms for days. A scrap of paper lay on the floor beside the coal-black stove. Mark picked it up and saw the familiar hammer and sickle device on the pamphlet. He screwed it up and hurled it against the wall. His men were waiting for him on the stoop. The strikers had dynamited the railway lines at Bramfontein Station and at the Church Street level crossing, so the regiment could not entrain at Fordsburg. Most of the roads were blocked with rubble and the detritus of the final struggle, but most dangerous was the possibility of stubborn strikers still hiding out in the buildings that lined the road through the dip to Johannesburg. Sean Courtney decided to move his men out up the slope to the open ground of the Crown Deep property. They marched out of Fordsburg in the darkness, before good shooting light. It had been a long, uncomfortable night, and nobody had slept much. Weariness made their packs leaden to carry and shackled their legs. There was less than a mile to go, however. The motor transport was drawn up in the open ground near the headgear of Crown Mine's main haulage, a towering structure shaped like the Eiffel Tower, steel girders riveted and herringbone for strength, rising a hundred feet to the huge wheels of the winching equipment. When the shift was in, these wheels spun back and forth, back and forth, lowering the cages filled with men and equipment hundreds of feet into the living earth and raising the millions of tons of gold-bearing rock out of the depths. Now the great wheels stood motionless. They had been dead for three months now, and the buildings clustered about the tower were gloomy and deserted. The transport was an assortment of trucks and commercial vans commandeered under martial law, Gravel lorries from the quarries, mining vehicles, even a bakery van. But it was clear that there was not enough to take out 600 men. As Mark came up, marching on the flank of A Company, there were half a dozen officers in discussion at the head of the convoy. Mark recognised the familiar bearded figure of General Courtney standing head and shoulders above the others, and his voice was raised in an angry growl. I want all these men moved before noon. They've done fine work. They deserve hot food and a place... At that moment he saw Mark and frowned heavily, waving him over and beginning to speak before he had arrived. 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 Where the hell have you been? Uh, with the company. I sent you to take a message and expected you back. You know damn well I didn't mean you to get into the fighting. You were on my staff, sir. 
Mark was tired and irritable, still emotionally disturbed by all that he had seen and done that day, and he was in no mood for one of the general's tantrums. His rebellious expression was unmistakable. Sir, he began, and Sean shouted at him, and don't take that tone to me, young man. An uncaring, completely irresponsible dark rage descended on Mark. He didn't give a damn for the consequences, and he leaned forward pale with fury and opened his mouth. The regiment was bunched up now, halted in the open roadway, neat symmetrical blocks of khaki, 600 men in ranks three deep. The shouted orders of the NCOs halted each section, one after the other, and stood them at the easy position. From the top of the steel headgear, they made an unforgettable sight in the rich yellow light of early morning. Ready, love, whispered Fergus MacDonald, and Helena nodded silently. Reality had long faded and be replaced by this floating dreamlike state. Her shoulders were raw where the carrying straps of the heavy ammunition boxes had bitten into the flesh, but there was no pain, just a blunting numbness of body. Her hands seemed bloated and clumsy, the nails broken off raggedly and rinded with black half-moons of dirt, and the harsh canvas of the ammunition belts between her fingers felt smooth as silk, the brass cartridge cases cool, so that she felt like pressing them to her dried, cracked lips. Why was Fergus staring at her that way, she wondered, with a prickle of irritation that did not last, once again the dreamy floating sensation. You can go down now, Fergus said quietly. You don't have to stay. He looked like a very old man, his face shriveled and falling in upon itself. The stubble of beard on his lined and haggard cheeks was silvery as diamond chips, but the skin was stained by smoke and dirt and sweat. Only the eyes below the peak of the cloth cap still burned with the dark fanatic flames. Helena shook her head. She wanted him to stop talking. The sound intruded and she turned her head away. The men below stood shoulder to shoulder in their orderly ranks. The low sun threw long, narrow shadows from their feet across the red dust of the roadway. A second longer, Fergus stared at her. She was a pale, wasted stranger, the bones pushing through the smooth, drawn flesh of her face, the scarf wound like a gypsy around her head, covering the black, cropped hair. All right, then, he murmured, and tapped the breech of the vicar's once, twice, training it slightly left. There was a group of officers near the head of the column. One of them was a big, powerful man with a dark beard. The sunlight sparkled on his shoulder tabs. Fergus lowered his head and looked through the rear sight of the vicars. There was a younger, slimmer officer with the other, and Fergus blinked twice rapidly, as something stirred deep in his memory. He hooked his fingers into the automatic safety bar and lifted it, priming the gun, and he brought his thumbs onto the firing button. He blinked again. The face of the young officer moved something in him. He felt a softening and blurring of his determination, and he rejected it violently and thrust down on the button with both thumbs. The weapon juddered on its tripod, and the long belt was sucked greedily into the breech, Helena's small pale fingers guiding it carefully, and the empty brass cases spewed out from under the gun, tinkling and ringing and bouncing off the steel girders of the headgear. The sound was a deafening, tearing roar that seemed to fill Helena's head and beat against her eyes like the frantic wings of a trapped bird. Even the most skilled marksman must guard against the tendency to ride up on a downhill shot. The angle from the top of the headgear was acute, and the soft yellowish early light further confused Fergus's aim. His first burst carried high, shoulder high instead of belly high, which is the killing line for machine gun fire. The first bullet struck before Mark heard the gun. One of them hit Sean Courtney high up in the big bulky body. It flung him forward, chest to chest with Mark, and both of them went down, sprawling in the roadway. Fergus tapped the breech block, dropping his aim a fraction onto the belly line, and traversed in a long, unhurried sweep along the ranks of standing soldiers, cutting them with the scythe of the vicars in the eternal seconds that they still stood in stunned paralysis. The stream of tracer hosed them and washed them into crazy heaps, 
piled them on each other, dead and wounded together, their screams high and thin in the rushing hurricane of Vickers fire. Sean rolled half off Mark, and his face was contorted, angry and outraged, as he tried to struggle onto his knees. But his one arm was dangling. His blood splattered them both, and he flopped helplessly. Mark wriggled out from under him, and looked up at the headgear. He saw the tracer flickering like fireflies and darting into the crowded roadway on the triumphant fluttering roar of the gun. Even in his own confusion and despair, he saw that the gunner had picked a good stance. He would be hard to come at. Then he looked down the road, and a cold fist clenched on his guts as he saw the bloody execution. The ranks had broken men running and stumbling for what little cover the vehicles and ditches offered. But the road was still filled. They lay in windrows and piles. They crawled and cried and twisted in the mud, which their blood was turning to chocolate red mud. And the gun swivelled and came back, flickering tracer into the carnage, chopping up the road surface into a spray of dust and leaping gravel, running viciously over the piles of wounded, coming back to where they lay. Mark twisted up into a crouch and slipped an arm under the general's chest. The weight of the man was enormous, but Mark found strength that he had not known before, goaded on by the fluttering, rushing roar of the vicars. Sean Courtney heaved himself up like a bull caught in quicksand, and Mark got him onto his feet. Bearing half his weight, Mark steadied him and kept him from falling. He weaved drunkenly, hunched over, bleeding badly, breathing noisily through his mouth, and Mark forced him into an ungainly crouching run. The guns swept their heels, kicking and smashing into the back of the young lieutenant who was creeping towards the ditch, dragging both useless legs behind him. He dropped face down and lay still. They reached the drainage ditch and tumbled into it. It was less than 18 inches deep, not enough to cover the general fully, even when he lay flat on his belly, and the vicars was still hunting. After that first long slicing traverse, it was firing short accurate bursts at selected targets, more deadly than random fire, keeping the gun from overheating and preventing a stoppage, conserving ammunition. Mark, weighing it all, realised that there was an old soldier up there in the tower. Where are you hit? he demanded. But Sean struck his hands away irritably, twisting his head to peer up into the tall steel headgear. Can you get him, Mark? he grunted, and pressed his fingers into his shoulder, where the blood welled up thick and dark as molasses. Not from here, Mark answered quickly. It had taken him seconds to assess the shoot. He's holed up tight. Merciful Jesus, my poor boys. He's built himself a nest, Mark studied the steelwork. The platform below the winch wheels was covered with heavy timber, fitted loosely into the framework of steel. The gunner had pulled these up and built himself four walls of wood, perhaps two feet thick. Mark could see the light glimmering through the open gaps in the floorboards and make out the shape and size of the fortified nest. Oh, he can hold us here all day. Sean looked down at the piles of khaki bodies in the roadway, and they both knew many of the wounded would bleed to death in that time. Nobody dared go out to them. The gun came back, ripping a flail across the earth near their heads, and they ducked their faces to the ground, pressing their bodies into the shallow ditch. The ground sloped down very gradually towards the steel tower. Only when you lay at ground level like this was the gradient apparent. Somebody will have to get under him or behind him, Mark spoke quickly, thinking it out. It's open ground all the way, Sean grunted. On the opposite side of the road, 50 yards away, a narrow-gauge railway ran down the short, open, grassy slope to the foot of the tower. It was used to truck the waste material from the shaft head to the rock dump half a mile away. Almost opposite where they lay, half a dozen of the steel cocoa pans had been abandoned at the beginning of the strike. They were small, four-wheeled tip-up trucks, coupled to each other in a line, each of them heaped high with big chunks of blue rock. Mark realised he was still wearing his pack, and he shrugged out of the straps as he planned his stalk, judging angles and range as he groped for the field dressing and handed it to Sean. Use this. Sean tore open the package and wadded the cotton dressing into the front of his tunic. His fingers were sticky with his own blood. 
Mark's P-14 rifle lay in the road where he had dropped it, but there were five clips of ammunition in the pouches on his webbing belt. Try and give me some covering fire when I start to go up, he said, and watched the tower for the next burst of tracer. Uh, you'll never get there, said Sean. We'll bring up 13-pounder and shoot the bastard out of them. Well, that'll take until noon. It'll be too late for them, he glanced at the wounded in the road. And at that moment, a stream of brilliant white tracer flew from the tower, aimed at the far end of the column. And Mark was up and running hard, stooping to gather the rifle at full run, crossing the road in a dozen flying strides, stumbling in the rough ground beyond, catching his balance and sprinting on. That stumble had cost him a tenth of a second, the margin of life and death, perhaps, while the gunner, high up in the tower, spotted him, swivelled the gun and lined up. The steel coker pans were just ahead, fifteen paces, but he wasn't going to make it. The warning flared in his brain, and he dropped into the short grass and rolled sideways, just as the storm of Vickers' fire filled the air about him with the lash of a hundred bullet whips. Mark kept rolling, like a log and the gun gouged a furrow out of the dry, stony earth inches from his shoulder. He came up against the wheels of the coca pan with a force that bruised his hip and made him cry out involuntarily. Vickers' bullets hammered and clanged against the steel body of the truck and howled off in ricochet. But Mark was under cover now. Mark, are you all right? The general's bull bellow carried across the road. Give me covering fire. You heard him, lads, shouted the general and one or two rifles began firing spasmodically from the ditches and from behind the stranded motor lorries. Mark dragged himself onto his knees and quickly checked the rifle, brushing the sights with his thumb to make certain they were clean of dirt and undamaged in the fall. Then he worked his way to the coupling of the coca pan and through the release toggle. The brake wheel was stiff and required both his hands to unwind it. The brake chocks squeaked softly as they disengaged, but the slope of the ground was so gentle that the truck did not move until Mark put his shoulder to it. He strained with all his weight before the steel wheels made a single reluctant revolution. Then gravity took her, and the coca pan began to roll. Give the bastard hell, Sean Courtney yelled as he realised suddenly what Mark was going to do, and Mark grinned without mirth at that characteristic exultation, and he trotted along, doubled up behind the heavily laden steel truck, a terrible, tearing, hammering storm of vickers broke over the slowly rolling truck, and instinctively Mark ducked lower and steadied himself against the metal side. He realised that as he came closer to the tyre, so the gunner's angle would change until he was shooting almost directly down on top of Mark. Then the side of the truck would give him no cover, but he was committed. Nothing would stop the slowly accelerating rush of the coca pan down the slope, it had the weight of ten tons of rock behind it, and its speed was gathering. Soon he would not be able to keep up with it. Already he was running, and the vickers roared again, the bullets screeching and wailing furiously off the steel body. Twisting as he ran, he slung the rifle on one shoulder and reached up to hook both hands over the side of the truck. He was pulled instantly off his feet, and they dangled without foothold, in danger of being caught up in the spinning steel wheels. He drew his knees up under his chin, hanging all his weight on his arms and taking the intolerable strain in his belly muscles as the truck flew down into the stretching octopus shadow of the headgear. Still hanging on his arms, Mark flung his head back and looked up. The tower was foreshortened by perspective, and it crouched over him like some menacing monster, stark against the mellow morning sky, crude black steel and timber balks pyramiding in the heavens. At its zenith, Mark could see the pale, mirror-like face of the gunner and the thick, water-jacketed barrel of the Vickers trained down at its maximum depression. The gun flamed, and bullets rang the steel near his head like a great bell. They churned into the blue rock, disintegrating into chips of buzzing metal and shattering the rock into vicious splinters and pellets that cut at his hands so that he screwed his eyes shut and clung helplessly. Such was the speed of the truck now that he was under fire for only seconds and the gunner's aim could not follow it as it raced down onto the concrete loading bank and slammed into the buffers.
The force of the impact was brutal, and Mark was hurled from his perch. The rifle strap snapped, and the weapon sailed away, and Mark turned in the air and hit the sloping concrete ramp on his side with a crash that jarred his teeth in his head. The rough concrete ripped away the thick barathea cloth from his hip and leg and shoulder and seared the flesh beneath with gravel burn. He came up at last against a stack of yellow-painted oil drums, and his first concern was to roll onto his back and stare upwards. He was under the headgear now, protected from the gunner by the legs and intricate steel girders of the tower itself, and he pulled himself to his feet, dreading the give and crippling drag of broken bone. But though his body felt crushed and bruised, he could still move, and he hobbled to where his rifle lay. The strap was broken, and the butt was cracked and splintered, and as he lifted it, it snapped into two pieces. He could not fire from the shoulder. The foresight had been knocked off, and the broken metal had a sugary grey crystalline look. He could not aim the weapon. He would have to get close, very close. There was a deep, bright scar in the steel of the breech. He muttered a prayer, please God, as he tried to work the bolt open. It was jammed solid, and he struggled with it fruitlessly for precious seconds. All right, he thought grimly. No butt to hold to the shoulder, no foresight with which to aim, and only the one cartridge in the breech. This is going to be interesting. He looked around him quickly. Beneath the steel tower, the two square openings to the main shaft were set into the concrete collar, protected by screens of steel mesh. The one cage stood at the surface station, doors open, ready for the next shift. The other was at the bottom station, a thousand feet below ground level. They had stood that way for months now. On the far side was the small service elevator, which would take maintenance teams the hundred feet to the summit of the tower in half a minute. However, there was no power on the shaft head, and the elevator was useless. The only other way up was the emergency ladder. This was an open steel stairway that spiralled up around the central shaft, protected only by a low handrail of inch piping. High above Mark's head, the vicars fired again, and Mark heard a scream of agony out there on the roadway. It hastened him, and he limped to the stairway. The steel mesh gate was open, the padlock shattered, and Mark knew by what route the sniper had reached his roost. He stepped onto the stairway and began to climb, following the coils up the casing, round and round and up and up. Always at his right hand, the open black mouth of the shaft gaped, an obscene dark orifice in the earth's surface, dropping straight and sheer into the very bowels, a thousand dark, terrifying feet. Mark tried to ignore it dragging his bruised and aching body up by the handrail, carrying the broken weapon in his other hand, and strained his neck backwards for the first glimpse of the gunner above. The vicars fired again, and Mark glanced sideways. He was high enough now to see into the road. One of the trucks was burning a tall dragon's breath of smoke and sullen flame pouring into the sky, and the drab khaki bodies were still strewn in the open, death's discarded toys. Even as he watched, the vicar's fire thrashed over them, mangling already dead flesh, and Mark's anger became cold and bright as a dagger's blade. Keep firing, love, Fergus croaked in that husky stranger's voice. Short bursts, count to twenty slowly, and then a touch on the bottom. I want him to think that I am still up here. He pulled the Webley from his belt and crawled on his belly towards the head of the steep staircase. Don't leave me, Fergus. It'll be all right, he tried to grin, but his face was grey and crumpled. Just you keep firing. I'm going down to meet him halfway. You'll not expect that. I don't want to die alone, she breathed. Stay with me. I'll be back, love. Don't fuss yourself. And he slid on his belly into the opening of the staircase. She felt like a child again, in one of those terrible dark nightmares, trapped and enmeshed in her own fate, and she wanted to cry out. The sound reached her lips, but died there as a slow, blubbering moan. A rifle bullet chunked into the barricade of timber beside her. They were shooting from down below. She could not pick them out, for they were hidden in the ditches, and the irregularities of the ground screened by long purple shadows, and her eyes were blurred with tears and with exhaustion, 
yet she found the last few grains of her strength and crawled to the gun. She squatted behind it, and her hands were almost too small to reach the firing button. She pressed the barrel downwards and forced her blaring vision to focus, marvelling at the little toy figures in the field of the sight. The gun juddered in her hands like a living creature. A short burst, she whispered to herself, repeating Fergus' instructions, and lifted her thumbs from the firing button. One, two, three, and she began to count to the next burst. Mark paused at the next burst of firing and stood for a moment, staring up. He was over halfway to the top, and now he could make out the floor of the service platform below the winch wheels, the platform on which the Vickers was sighted. There were narrow cracks in the woodwork through which bright lines of open sky showed clearly, and as he watched he saw one of the lines of light interrupted by a dark movement beyond. It was that flicker of movement that caught his attention, and he realised that he was looking at the body of the person who served the gun. He must be squatting directly over one of the narrow joints in the floor of a platform, and his movements blocked out part of that bright line of light. A bullet through the gap would cripple and pin him, but he glanced at the broken weapon in his hand and knew that he would have to get closer, much closer. He began to run upwards, and though he tried to keep his weight lightly on the balls of his feet, the hobnails in his boots rang on the steel stairs. Fergus MacDonald heard them and checked his own run, shrinking into the protective lee of one of the steel girders. One man only, he muttered, but coming up fast. He dropped on one knee and peered down through the gaps between the stairs, hoping for a sight of the man who he was hunting. The steps overlapped each other like fan playing cards, and the lateral supports of the tower formed an impenetrable steel forest below him. The only way he could hope for a glimpse was to hang out over the handrail and look down the central shaft well. The idea of that thousand-foot black hole repelled him, and he had formed an estimate of his opponent high enough to guess that the reward for putting his head over the side would be a bullet between the eyes. He edged into a better position where he could cover the next spiral of staircase below him. Now let him come up to me, he decided and braced his arm against the girder at the level of his chin, and laid the webley over the crook of his elbow to give the heavy pistol support. He knew that over ten paces it was wildly inaccurate, but the dead rest would give him at least one fair shot. He cocked his head slightly to listen to the clatter of booted feet on steel, and he judged that the man was very close. One more spiral of the stair would bring him into shot. Carefully he thumbed back the hammer of the webley, and looked down over the slotted rear sight. Above them the vicars fired again, and Mark paused to catch his breath and check the situation of the gunner, and to his dismay he realised that he had climbed too high in the tower. He had changed the angle of sight and could no longer see through the cracks in the timber platform. He had to retreat carefully down the staircase before once again the bright lines of light opened in the dark underbelly of timber. A vague blur of movement reassured him that the gunner had not changed his position. He was still squatting over the joint, but the shot was almost impossible. He was shooting directly upwards, awkward even in the best conditions. But now he had no butt to steady the rifle and no foresight. He was shooting into a single dark mass of timber and had to guess the position of the crack because the gunner's body obscured the light from the far side. The crack itself was only two inches wide and if he missed by a smallest fraction, the bullet would bury itself harmlessly in the thick timber. He tried not to think that there would be only one shot. The jammed breach made that certain. He put his hip to the guardrail and leaned out over the open shaft, squinted upwards, trying to set the target in his mind as he lifted the broken rifle in an easy, natural movement. He knew that he had to make the shot entirely by instinct. He had no chance if he hesitated or tried to hold his aim steadily on the target. He swept up the shattered weapon, and at the moment the long barrel aligned, he pressed the trigger. In the flash and thunder of the shot, a tiny white splinter of wood jumped from the edge of the crack. The bullet had touched wood, and Mark felt an instant of utter dismay. Then the body that had obscured the light 
was jerked abruptly aside, and the crack was a single uninterrupted line again, and on the platform somebody screamed. Helena MacDonald had just reached the count of twenty again, and was aiming at a gathering of men she could see grouping beyond one of the lorries. She squatted low over the gun and was on the point of jamming her thumbs down on the firing button when the bullet came up through the floor timbers. It had touched one of the hard mahogany balks, just enough to split the casing of the bullet and alter its shape, mushrooming it slightly so that it did not enter her body through a neat round puncture. It tore a ragged entry into the soft flesh at the juncture of her slightly spread thighs and plunged upwards through her lower abdomen, striking and shattering the thick bony girdle of her pelvis, glancing off the bone with still enough impetus to bruise and weaken the lower branch of the descending aorta, the great artery that runs down from the heart, before going on to embed itself in the muscles high on the left side of her back. It lifted Helena into the air and hurled her across the platform onto her face. Oh God, oh God, oh God, help me, Fergus! Fergus, I don't want to die alone! she screamed, and the sound carried clearly to the two men in the steel tower below her. Mark recognised the voice instantly. It did not need the name to confirm it. His mind shied at the enormity of what he had done. The broken rifle almost slipped from his hands, but he saved it and caught at the handrail for support. Helena cried again, a sound without words. It was exactly that strange, wild cry that she had uttered at the zenith of one of their wildest flights of passion together, and for an instant Mark remembered her face, shining and triumphant, the dark eyes burning and the open red mouth, and the soft pink petal of her tongue aflutter. Mark started to run, hurling himself upwards. The screams caught Fergus like a flight of arrows in the heart, a piercing physical agony. He dropped the pistol to his side and stood irresolute, staring upwards, not knowing what had happened, except that Helena was dying. He had heard the death scream too often to have any doubt about that. What he was listening to was mortal agony, and he could not force his body to begin the climb upwards to the horror he knew that waited him there. While he hesitated, Mark came around the angle of the staircase, and Fergus was not ready for him. The pistol was at his side, and he fell back and tried to bring it up, to fire at point-blank range into the chest of the uniformed figure. Mark was as off-balance as he was. He had not expected to run into another enemy, but he saw the pistol and swung the broken rifle at Fergus's head. Fergus ducked, and the Webley fired wide. The bullet flew inches past Mark's temple, and the report slammed against his eardrum and made him flinch his head. The rifle struck the girder behind Fergus and was jerked from Mark's grip. Then they came together chest to chest. Mark seized the wrist of his pistol hand and held with all his strength. Neither of them had recognised the other. Fergus had aged into a grey caricature of himself and his eyes were shaded by the cloth cap. Mark was in unfamiliar uniform, dusty and bloodied, and he had changed also. Youth had become man. Mark was taller, but they were matched in weight, and Fergus was endowed with the terrible fighting rage of the berserker, which gave him superhuman strength. He drove Mark back against the guardrail and bowed his back over the open shaft. But Mark still had his pistol wrist, and the weapon was pointed up over his head. Fergus was sobbing wildly driving with all the wiry, uncanny strength of a body tempered by hard physical work and fired now by the strength of anger and sorrow and despair. Mark felt his feet slip, the hobnails of his boots skidding on the steel steps, and he went over further, feeling the mesmeric suck of a thousand feet of open space plucking at his back. Above them, Helena screamed again, and the sound drove like a needle into the base of Fergus' brain. He shuddered, and his body convulsed in one great rigid spasm that Mark could not hope to hold. He went backwards over the guardrail, but still he had his grip on Fergus's gun hand, and his other arm he had wound about his shoulders. They slid into the void, locked together in a horrible parody of a lover's embrace. But as they started to fall, Mark hooked both legs over the rail like a trapeze artist and jerked to a halt, hanging upside down into the shaft. Fergus was somersaulted over him 
by the force of his own thrust. As he turned in the air, the cloth cap flew from his head, and he was torn from the arm that Mark had around his shoulder. Round his shoulder. Round his shoulder. Round his shoulder. He came up with a jerk that almost tore Mark's shoulder from its socket, for some animal instinct had kept Mark's grip locked on the pistol hand, and he dangled from that precious hold. The two of them pendulumed over the black emptiness of the shaft. Mark's legs hooked over the rail, hanging at full stretch, with Fergus's body the next link in the chain. Fergus's head was thrown back, staring up at Mark, and with the cap gone, his lank, sandy hair fell back from his face, and Mark felt fresh shock loosen his grip. Fergus, he croaked. But the madman's eyes that stared back at him were devoid of recognition. Try and get a grip, Mark pleaded, swinging Fergus towards the staircase. Grab the rail. He knew he could not hold many seconds longer. The fall had wrenched and weakened his arm, and the blood was rushing to his head in this inverted position. He could feel his face swelling and suffusing, and the pounding ache in his temples, while the black and hungry mouth of the shaft sickened him. With his other hand, he groped and got a second hold on Fergus's wrist. Fergus twisted in his grip, but instead of going for the rail, he reached upwards and took the pistol from his own hand, transferring it to his free hand. No! Mark shouted at him. Fergus, it's me, it's me, Mark! But Fergus was far past all reason as he juggled with the Webley, getting a firing grip on the hilt with his left hand. Kill them, he muttered. Kill all the scabs. He lifted the barrel to aim upwards at Mark, dangling over the drop, twisting slowly in that double retaining grip. No, Fergus, screamed Mark and the muzzle of the revolver pointed into his face. At that range, it would tear half his head away, and he saw Fergus' forefinger tighten on the trigger, the knuckle whitening under pressure. He opened his hands, and Fergus's wrist slipped from his fingers. He spun away, falling swiftly, and the revolver never fired. But Fergus began to scream a high, thin wail. Still hanging upside down, Mark watched Fergus's body, limbs spread and turning like the spokes of a wheel, as it dropped away, shrinking rapidly in size, and the despairing, wailing cry receding with it, dwindling away to a small, pale speck, like a dust mote, which was swallowed abruptly into the dark mouth of the shaft far below, and the wailing cry with it. In the silence afterwards, Mark hung bat-like, blinking the sweat out of his eyes, and for many seconds unable to find strength to move. Then from the platform above him came a long shuddering moan, and it roused him. Forcing his bruised body to respond, he managed to get a grip on the guardrail and drag himself up until he tumbled onto the staircase and started up it on rubbery legs. Helena had dragged herself to the pile of timber, leaving a dark wet smear across the platform. The khaki breeches she wore were sodden with blood, and it oozed from her still to form a spreading puddle in which she sat. She lay back against the timber next to the tripoded vicars in an attitude of utter weariness, and her eyes were closed. Helena, Mark called her, and she opened her eyes. Mark, she whispered, but she did not seem surprised. It was almost as though she expected him. Her face was completely drained of all colour, the lips seemed rimmed with frost, and her skin had an icy sheen to it. Why did you leave me? she asked. Hesitantly, he crossed to her. He knelt beside her, looked down at her lower body, and felt the scalding flood of vomit rise in his throat. I truly loved you. Her voice was so light, breathing soft as the dawn wind in the desert. And you went away. He put out his hand to touch her legs, to spread them and examine the wound. But he could not bring himself to do it. You won't go away again, Mark, she asked, and he could hardly catch the words. I knew you would come back to me. I, I won't go away again, he promised. 
not recognizing his own voice, and the smile flickered on her icy lips. Hold me, please, Mark. I don't want to die alone. Awkwardly, he put an arm around her shoulders, and her head lolled sideways against him. Did you ever love me, Mark? Even a little bit? Yes, I loved you, he told her, and the lie came easily. Suddenly there was a hissing spurt of brighter, redder blood from between her thighs as the damaged artery erupted. She stiffened, her eyes flew wide open, and then her body seemed to melt against him, and her head dropped back. Her eyes were still wide open and dark as a midnight sky. As he stared at it, slowly her face changed. It seemed to melt like white candle wax held too close to the flame. It ran and wavered and reformed, and now it was the face of a marble angel, smooth and white and strangely beautiful, the face of a dead boy in a land far away. And the fabric of Mark's mind pulled and tore. He began to scream, but no sound came from his throat. The scream was deep down in his soul, and his face was without expression. His eyes dry of tears. They found him like that an hour later, when the first soldiers climbed cautiously up the iron staircase to the top of the steel tower. He was sitting quietly, holding the woman's dead body in his arms. Well, said Sean Courtney, they've hanged Taffy Long. He folded the newspaper with an angry gesture and dropped it onto the paving beside his chair. In the dark, shiny foliage of the loquat tree that spread above them, the little white eyes pinkled and twittered as they probed the blossoms with sharp, busy beaks and their wings fluttered like moths about the candle. Nobody at the breakfast table spoke. All of them knew how Sean had fought for leniency for those strikers on whom the death sentence had been passed. He had used all his influence and power, but it had not availed against the vindictive and vengeful who wanted full measure of retribution for all the horrors of the revolt. Sean brooded now at the head of the table, hunched in his chair with his beard on his chest, staring out over the Ladyburg Valley. His arm was still supported by the linen sling. It had not healed cleanly, and the bullet wound was still open and draining. The doctors were anxious about it, but Sean had told them, Leopard and bullet and shrapnel and knife, I've had them all before. Don't twist a gut for me. Old meat heals slowly, but it heals hard. Ruth Courtney watching him now, was not worried about the wounds of the flesh. It was the wounds of the mind that concerned her. Both the men of her household had come back deeply marked by the lash of guilt and sorrow. She was not sure what had happened during those dark days, for neither man had spoken about it, but the horror of it still stalked even here at Lionkop, even in the bright soft days, on these lovely dreaming hills where she had brought them to heal and rest. This was the special place, the centre and fortress of their lives, where Sean had brought her as his bride. They owned other great houses, but this was home, and she had brought Sean here now after the strife and the turmoil, but the guilt and the horror had come with them. Madness, muttered Sean, utter raving madness. How they cannot see it, I do not know. He shook his head and was silent a moment, then he sighed. Oh, well, we hang them now and make them live forever. They'll haunt and hound us all our days. You tried, dear, said Ruth softly. Trying isn't enough, he growled. In the long run, all that counts as succeeding. Oh, Peter, they killed hundreds of people, Storm burst out, shaking her shining head at him with angry colour in her cheeks. They even tried to kill you. Mark had not spoken since the meal began. But now he lifted his head and looked at Storm across the table. She checked the other words that sprang to her lips as she saw his expression. He had changed so much since he had come home. It was as though he had aged a hundred years. Though there was no new line or mark on his face, yet he seemed to have shed all his youth and taken upon himself the full burden of knowledge and earthly experience. When he looked at her like that, she felt like a child.
It was not a feeling she relished. She wanted to pierce this new armour of remoteness that invested him. They're just common murderers, she said, addressing the words not to her father. We are all murderers, Mark answered quietly, and though his face was still remote, the knife clattered against his plate as he put it down. Will you excuse me, please, Mrs. Courtney? He turned to Ruth, and she frowned quickly. Oh, Mark, you've not touched your food. I'm riding into the village this morning. You ate no dinner last night. I want the mail to catch the noon train. He folded his napkin, rose quickly and strode away across the lawn, and Ruth watched the tall, graceful figure with a helpless shrug before turning to Sean. He's wound up so tight like a watch spring about to snap, she said. What's happening to him, Sean? Sean shook his head. It's something that nobody understands, he explained. We had so much of it in the trenches. It's as though a man can stand just so much pressure and then something breaks inside him. We called it shell shock, for want of a better name. But it's not just the shelling, he paused. I've never told you about Mark before, about why I picked him, about how and when I first met him. And he told it to them. Sitting in the cool green shade of the loquat tree, he told them of the mud and the fear and the horror of France. It's not just for a single time or a day or a week, but it goes on for what becomes an eternity. But it is worse for a man who has special talents. We, the generals, have to use them ruthlessly. Mark was one of those. And he told them how he had used Mark like a hunting dog, and his two women listened intently, all of them bound up in the life of the young man who had gradually come to mean so much to each of them. A man gathers horror and fear like a ship gathers weed. It's below the waterline, you cannot see it, but it is there. Mark carries that burden, and at Fordsburg something happened that brought him close to the breaking point. He is on the very edge of it now. What can we do for him? asked Ruth softly watching his face, happy for him that he had a son at last, for she had long known that that was what Sean saw in Mark. She loved her husband enough not to resent that it was not her own womb that had given him what he so desperately wanted, glad only that he had it at last and that she could share it with him. Sean shook his head. I don't know, and Storm made an angry hissing sound. They both looked at her. Sean felt that soft warmth spreading through his chest, a feeling of awe that this lovely child could be part of him. Storm looked so smooth and fragile, yet he knew she had the strength of braided whipcord. He knew also that though she had the innocence of a newly opened bloom, yet she could sting like a serpent. She had the brightness and beauty that dazzled, and yet below that were depths that mystified and awed him. And when her moods changed so swiftly, like this unaccountable spurt of anger, he was enchanted by her, under her fairy spell. He frowned heavily now to hide his feelings. Yes, Missy, what is it now? he grumped at her. He's going away, she said, and Sean blinked at her, swaying back in his chair. What are you talking about? he demanded. Mark, he's going away. How do you know that? Something deep inside of Sean cringed at the prospect of losing another son. I know. I just know, she said, and came to her feet with a flash of long, sleek limbs, like a gazelle rising in alarm from its grassy bed. She stood over him. You didn't think he'd be your lapdog forever, she asked, a biting scorn in her tone that at another time would have brought from him a sharp retort. Now he stared at her speechless. Then suddenly she was gone, crossing the lawn in the sunlight that gilded her loose dark hair with stark white light and struck through the flimsy stuff of her dress, revealing her long slim body in a stark dark silhouette, surrounding her with a shimmering halo of light that made her seem like some lovely unearthly vision. Don't you see that it's that it's better that you cry a little now than cry for the rest of your life? Mark asked gently, trying not to let her see how the tears had eroded his resolve. Won't you ever come back? Marion Littlejohn was not one of those women who cried well. Her little round face seemed to smear and lose its shape 
like unfired clay, and her eyes swelled and puffed pinkly. Marion, I don't even know where I'm going. How can I know if I'm coming back? I, I don't understand, Mark. I, I truly don't understand. She twisted the damp linen handkerchief in her hands, and she sniffed wetly. We were, we were so happy. I did everything I knew to make you happy. Even, even that. It's not you, Marion, Mark assured her hurriedly. He did not want to be reminded of that which Marion always referred to as that. It was as though she had loaned him a treasure which had to be returned with interest at usurious rates. Didn't I make you happy, Mark? I tried so hard. Marion, I keep trying to tell you. You are a fine, pretty girl. You are kind and good and the nicest person I know. Then why don't you want to marry me? Her voice rose into a wail, and Mark glanced with alarm down the length of the porch. He knew that sisters and brothers-in-law were probably straining their hearing for snatches of the conversation. It's, it's that I don't want to marry anybody. She made a low moaning sound and then blew her nose loudly on the inadequate scrap of sodden linen. Mark took his own handkerchief from his inside pocket and she accepted it gratefully. I don't want to marry anybody. Not yet, he repeated. Not yet? She seized the words. But some day? Some day, he agreed. When I have discovered what it is I want out of my life and how I am going to get it. I'll... I'll wait for you, she tried to smile, a brave, watery, pink smile. I'll, wa I'll wait for you, Mark. No! Mark felt alarm flare through every nerve of his body. It had taken all his courage to tell her, and now it seemed that he had achieved nothing. God knows how long it will be, Marion. There'll be dozens of other men. You're a kind, sweet, loving person. I'll, I'll wait for you, she repeated firmly, her features regaining their usual pleasant shape and her shoulders losing their dejected droop. Please, Marion, it's not fair on you. Mark tried desperately to dissuade her, realising that he had failed dismally. But she gave one last hearty sniff and swallowed what was left of her misery as though it were a jagged piece of stone. Then she smiled at him, blinking the last tears from her face. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm a, I'm a very patient person. You'll see, she told him comfortably. You don't understand. Mark shrugged with helpless frustration. Oh, I, I do understand, Mark, she smiled again. But now it was the indulgent smile of a mother of a naughty child. When you are ready, you come back here to me. She stood up and smoothed down the sensible skirts. Now come along. They're waiting lunch for us. Storm had taken great care choosing her position. She had wanted to catch the play of afternoon light and the run of the clouds across the escarpment, and yet to be able to see into the gorge, for the white plume of falling spray to be the focus of the painting. She wanted also to be able to see down along the Ladyburg Road, and yet not be overlooked by a casual observer. She placed her easel on the lip of a small saucer of folded ground near the eastern boundary peg of Lioncop, positioning both easel and herself with an artist's eye for aesthetic detail. But when she posed on the lip of the saucer, with the palette cradled in the crook of her left arm and the brush in the other, she lifted her chin and looked up at the powerful sweep of land and forest and sky, at the way the light was working, and at the golden-tinged turquoise of the sky. And immediately she was intrigued. The pose was no longer theatrical, and she began to work, tilting her head to appraise a colour mix, moving about the canvas in a slow ritual, like a temple maid making the sacrifice, so completely absorbed that when she heard the faint putter of Mark's motorcycle, it did not penetrate into the silken cocoon of concentration she had woven about herself. Although her original intention in coming to this place had been to waylay him, now he was almost past before she was aware of him, and she paused with the brush held high in one hand, caught in the soft golden light of late afternoon, a much more striking picture than she could have composed with studied care. The dusty strip of road snaked 500 feet below where she stood, making its first big loop onto the slope of the escarpment, and as he came into the bend, Mark's eyes were drawn naturally to the small, delicate figure on the slope. 
There were clouds along the summit of the escarpment, and the late sun burned through the gaps, cutting long shimmering beams across the valley, and one of these fell full on Storm. She stood completely still, staring down the slope at him, making no gesture of recognition or welcome. He pulled the big machine into the side of the road and sat astraddle, pushing the goggles onto his forehead. Still she did not move, and they stared at each other. Mark made a move at last, as though to restart the machine, and Storm felt a shock of deprivation, although it did not show either on her face nor in the stillness of her body. She exerted all her will, trying consciously to reach him with her mind, and he paused and looked up at her again. Come, she willed him, and with an impatient, almost defiant gesture, he pulled the goggles off his head and stripped the gloves off his hands. Serenely, she turned back to the painting, a small secret smile playing like light across the soft, parted lips, and she did not watch him climbing up through the yellow knee-high grass. She heard his breathing behind her, and she smelled him. He had a special smell that she had learned to know, a flowery smell, a little like a suckling puppy, or a freshly polished leather. It made her skin feel hot and sensitised, and put a painful little catch in her breathing. That's beautiful, he said, and his voice felt like the touch of fingers along the nape of her neck. She felt the fine, soft hair there rise, and the flush of blood spread warmly down her chest and turn her nipples into hard little pebbles. They ached with something which was not pain, something more obsessive. She wanted him to touch her there, and at the thought she felt her legs tremble under her and the muscles cramped deeply in the wedge of her thighs. It's truly beautiful, he said again, and he was so close she could feel his breath stir the fine hair of her neck, and another thrill ran down her spine. This time it was like a claw cutting through her flesh, and she clenched her buttocks to ride the shock of it as though she was astride a mettlesome horse. She stared at the painting, and she saw that he was right. It was beautiful, even though it was half finished. She could see the rest of it in her mind, and it was beautiful and right. But she wanted the touch of his hands now. It was as though the painting had heightened her emotional response, opened some last forbidden door, and now she wanted his touch with a terribly deep physical ache. She turned to him, and he was so close and tall that she felt her breathing catch again and she looked up into his face. Touch me, she willed him. Touch me, she commanded silently. But his hands hung at his side, and she could not fathom his eyes. She could not stand still a moment longer, and she stirred her hips in a slow, voluptuous gesture. Something was melting and burning deep in her lower body. Touch me, she tried to force him silently to her will, Touch me there where it hurts so fiercely. But he did not heed her, would not respond to all her silent pleas. And suddenly she was angry. She wanted to lash out at him, to strike him across that solemn, handsome face. She had a mental image of ripping his shirt away and sinking her nails deep into the smoothly muscled chest. She stared now at the V of his open shirt, at the coils of dark hair, and his skin had an oiled gloss gilded by the sun to warm golden brown. Her anger flared and focused. He had aroused these surging emotions, which she could neither understand or control, these heady, terrifying waves of physical arousal, and she wanted to punish him for it, to make him suffer, to have him mauled by his desires, as she was. At the same instant in time, she wanted to take that splendid, proud head of his and hold it to her bosom like a mother holds her child. She wanted to cherish and gentle and love him, and claw and savage and ravage and hurt him and she was confused and giddy and angry and puzzled. But most of all, she was racing high on a wave of physical excitement that turned her bird-like and quick and vital. I suppose you've been bouncing about on that fat little trollop of yours, she almost snarled it at him. Immediately the hurt and shock showed in his eyes, and she was pleased and savagely triumphant, but also aching with contrition, wanting to fall at his feet and plead for forgiveness, 
or to lash out with her nails and raise deep bleeding lines across that smooth brown dearly beloved face. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if the providence that gave you your beauty and your talent had thought to make you a nice person at the same time, he said quietly, almost sadly, instead of a vicious, spoiled little brat. She gasped with the delicious, profane shock of it. The insult gave her cause to discard the last vestige of control. Now she could loose the rein and use lash and spur without restraint. Oh, you swine! She flew at him, going for his eyes, knowing he was too weak and strong for her, but forcing violent physical contact on him, forcing him to seize her. And when he held her powerless by both arms, she flung her body against his, driving him back a pace, and she saw the surprise on his face. He had not expected such strength. She turned against him, her body fined and tuned and hardened by physical exercise on the courts and in the saddle, forcing him off balance, and as he shifted his weight from foot to foot, she hooked one ankle with hers and threw her weight in the opposite direction. They fell together, tumbling backwards into the grassy saucer of ground, and he released her wrists, using both hands to break their fall and cushion her shock as she landed on her back. Instantly she was at him with both hands, and her nails stung his neck. He grunted, and she saw the first flare of real anger in his eyes. It delighted her, and when he seized her wrist, she twisted and bit him, in the hard, sinewy muscle of his forearm. Hard enough to break the skin and leave a double crescent of small, neat teeth marks. He gasped, and his anger mounted as he rolled over her, pinning her lower body with one leg as he fought to hold her flying, flailing hands. She bucked under him. Her skirts had pulled up to her waist, one slim, smooth thigh thrusting up, natural, untutored, cunning, into his groin, not hard enough to injure him, but enough to make him suddenly conscious of his own arousal. As he realised what was happening, his grip of her arms slackened, and he tried desperately to disengage, but one of her arms slid around his neck, and the silken warmth of her cheek was pressed to his. His hands acted without command, running down the deep groove in the centre of her arched back, following the small hard knuckles of her spine to the rounded divide of her buttocks, felt through the glossy slipperiness of silken underwear. Her breathing rasped hoarsely as sandpaper, and she shifted her head, and her mouth joined his, arching her back and lifting her lower body to let her silk underwear come away freely in his hands. The waxen fork of her body rose out of the bright, disordered petals of her skirts like the stamen of some wondrously exotic orchid, its flowing perfection interrupted only by the deep, finely sculptured pit in the centre of the perfect plane of her belly, and below that the shockingly abrupt explosion of dark, smoky curls, a fat, deep wedge that changed shape as she relaxed in a slow, voluptuous movement. Oh, Mark, she breathed. Oh, Mark, I can't stand it. Her anger had all evaporated. She was soft and breathless, slowly entwining, warm and gentle and loving. But the sound of her voice woke him suddenly to reality. He realised the betrayal of the trust placed in him by Sean Courtney, the abuse of a privileged position, and he pulled away from her, appalled at his own treachery. Oh, I must be mad, he gasped with horror, and tried to roll away from her. Her response was instantaneous, the instinctive reaction of a deprived lioness, that uncanny ability to go from soft, purring repose to dangerous, blazing anger in the smallest part of a second. Her hand cracked across his face in an explosion of brilliant Catherine wheels of colour that starred his vision, and she screamed at him, What kind of man are you? She tried to strike him again, but he was ready for her, and they rolled together chest to chest in the grass. You are a nothing and you'll stay like that because you haven't got the guts and strength to be anything else. She hissed at him, and the words hurt a thousand times worse than the blow. His own anger flared to match hers, and he came up over her. Damn you! How dare you say that? She shouted back at him. At least I dare. You wouldn't dare. But she broke off then, as she felt it happen. Then she cried out again, but in a different voice. Oh, God! Her whole body racked as she locked him to her enfolding and holding him while she purred and murmured with a voice gone low and husky 
and victorious. Oh, Mark. Oh, darling, darling Mark. <laughs>